So the first presentation is by Esther, and she is going to talk about trees and forests for climate adaptation and resilience of people and ecosystems. Yes, please. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. So I will talk about um, nature-based solutions for climate adaptation and resilience of people and ecosystems. And my presentation will have, uh, I don't know, maybe trees and forests are new for most of you. And I will talk about it, the science I do, and uh, what can we do together also with this new team. So it will combine both what we do and the uh, future. So um, the outline, uh, there are two global challenges. What countries and forests do? Uh, can they be part of the solution and the approach, the tools we use? and the highlights about the applications and the tools we use and the outlook, as I said, what we can do together. So you know, there are two major goals of our time. One is food security, achieving food security. There are two billion more people to feed by 2050. And this is, there is climate change uh, going on and adaptation to climate change is critical. And as you know, agriculture, forestry, and nature, also deforestation, contributes to emission, so we need to cut uh, emission, and it has to be part of the solution. And this is on top of the major development challenges that are ongoing, not only in Africa, I think it's in most part of the developing world, like land scarcity, degradation, lack of food, fuel, wood, and uh, fodder, and all that. So women, they have to travel for four or five hours and you see the degradation and actually people use cow dung uh, because there is no biomass. So when you look at climate change, yesterday you were talking about forest fire, uh, tree mortality is evident, I mean everywhere in Europe trees are dying and this is a recent global map, you see the distribution of tree mortality globally, it's increasing and when you look at the climate projection, if the climate is going dry and precipitation you know, low, tree mortality, the fire frequency will increase. So what do we do? So examining the long-term resil resilience of the forests and woodlands is really critical against this uh, climate change. So there are many global initiatives, regional initiatives like uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, Red Plus, Convention on Biological Diversity, the Bone Challenge to restore about 150 million hectares of forest land and degraded lands by 2030, African FR 100 to restore 100 million hectares of land in Africa, uh, the 20 point by 20 for Latin America and what have you, a lot of them. So. But whether it's developmental challenge or climate change related challenge, you know, the challenges are interwoven and the solution should be also integrated approach. So countries and forests, can nature be part of the solution? Answer is yes, because of their multifunctional properties, trees and forests are critical to address developmental challenges and also environmental challenges like, you know, they are sorts of uh, food, feed, fodder, and what have you. There are products, three products, forest products, and there are services like to protect for uh, erosion, shade, and many others. As you know, I don't have to lecture about it because you know most of you. And they act like an ecosystem lung because they absorb CO2 and they emit oxygen, and they serve as liver because they are filtering atmospheric pollutants like, you know, nitrogen oxide, what you know, the pollutants have been talking about. So they are also you know, important, especially uh, Professor, he was talking about climate smart cities, because heat intensity is increasing in cities, these urban islands, and they can serve as shade, and when they, you know, then shade decreases temperature, then it protects us from harmful pollutants. And also, instead of using um, air conditioner, if you use trees, then we also reduce emission. So, but okay, this is all great, but despite all their importance, their future in this global warming world is, not, is uncertain. So what can we do? 
the biggest question now going on is, can our trees, forests, woodlands adapt fast enough to this ongoing climate change? Because I showed you the increase in tree mortality and fire frequency and all that. You see the cows, they can go under tree, and, but the trees, they are less mobile. Of course, trees also migrate. But we know, we should know how they are, they are physiology, they are how they act, they are ecology to help them migrate as well. So this is uh, also societal demand is changing. It's not only the services and products, but they are also paying for the ecosystem services like for carbon, for example. There is carbon payment. So this is really critical. So how do we know? How do we do to, what do we do to increase the resilience of species? Because in terms of crops, if it is drought sensitive, you can change it in one year. But trees are there for decades and centuries. So we have to be careful when we plant them now because we know that they have to stay for decades and centuries. So resilience is really critical. What do we mean by resilient is resilience is disturbance is normal. Fire, forest fire is normal. But their ability to absorb disturbances and to reorganize themselves under change to maintain similar functioning and service is really critical. And the rate of recovery, there is forest fire, maybe there is deforestation and all that, but how fast are they to recover themselves? So this is essential, as I said, but we don't have, in most places, especially in Africa, we don't have data. So the tool we use, last time somebody was mentioning about past, present, future. We use the past as a lens to the future. As I said, there are many global initiatives that I listed that are related to ecosystem restoration. They are ongoing all over the world. But for this to succeed, we have to plant the right tree at the right site for the right purpose. So how do we do that? We have to know. We cannot plant now and monitor for 30, 40 years and then plant the right trees. But we can look past how they have been doing in the past, so we can screen the resilient species. You know, when I say the right trees, the trees that you plant for timber or to filter the waste that you have been talking about for fruit or nutrition, they are different. People are different, trees are also different. They are different species with different purposes. So we have to select that one. So we look at the past and we use the past as a lens of, for the future. So we measure from uh, you know, short term to long term uh, effects that are from the leaf to tree and plot level, the landscape level. And we look at the short term change in terms of physiology and uh, in the long term in terms of morphology. So how is it changing their hydraulic conductivity, their water use efficiency, their uh, you know, uh, wood anatomy is changing. So this is very important in terms of water budget and carbon sequestration, and as I say, to plant the right trees in the right forms. So a question to all of you. How old do you think trees can get? How old? What is the oldest tree? Actually, trees are the oldest things on the planet, living things on the planet. Trees can get about 4,000 years old. Yeah, and trees are really wonderful organisms. Any proof, and, any proof for 4,000 years living tree? I am going to show you that. <laughs> okay. In India, we have one. In where, where? In India? 4,000? Yes. Yeah, more than that. Mm. I don't and okay. when I And when I went to, yeah. How it, do you prove that? Uh, you have to read about it in Kurukshetra, where Lord Krishna mm -hmm. was the main anchor of Mahabharata. That is the place where they claim that this tree is 5,000 years old. From historical, okay. But there is also scientific way to prove it. Sure. Okay. So there are the oldest living things, I mean the longest living uh, organisms in the world, I mean, yeah. And if we know to read or speak their language, they have also language. So this is from uh, USA, California, the spinous is the oldest, 4,768 years. And then you look at the structure, it's like a book, it has, you can read, and I can see fire, and you know the morphology, all that change. And this is Baobab, to the right, in Africa, about 1,500 years. So how many of you know about the science of dendrochronology? Anyway, so dendrochronology means dendro is wood, chronology is time, seconds. So it is a science, it is well-established science in temperate regions, of course, 
because trees, they don't grow the whole year, yeah? Why? Because in winter it's a difficult situation, right, to grow. So they stop growth, and then they show this kind of structure. You see that circle, you see, that is called rings. So this is formed at the end of the growing season, marking the end of the growing period for a year, yeah? Because it's difficult, they stop, and then when the conditions are okay, they start growing. So in temperate, we have clear climate seasonality, winters, summer. But there was a misconception that in tropical trees, like in Africa, the sun is shining all the time, so why should trees stop and form these rings? So people assume they don't, and the science is not well developed. But we proved the last decades or so there are many species in the tropics that they form ring, and we can really read, I mean, create, generate a lot of data essential for what I have been talking about. So it's very important. You can use trees, like you can use also sediments, for example, to look at hydrology in terms of groundwater fluctuation, uh, flood reconstruction, river flow history. You can use the trees as a source of data. Environmental research like greenhouse effects, heavy metal and air pollution, forest disease and forest fire, you can look at the trees and you can read the fire frequency and how it's changing so that you can say, why is it changing now? Is it because of climate or was it also before the climate changed? And is it because of land use change? Yeah, land policy change. So you can study from using the trees as a book. In terms of ecology, ecology, age structure, regeneration, dynamics, and all that, climate, climate reconstruction, climate information, geomorphology, erosion rates. You can look at the trees and tell the erosion rates. Debris flow frequency, slope, slope movement. So this is a well-developed science that is in technology. I think it has a lot of, I mean, um, link with you. So we use this science in Africa. There was no lab. So I studied by chance in Germany, listening to a seminar, and I said, I wanted to do this. Because I learned in school that in the tropics, you cannot uh, use this science because they don't form rings, but in the temperate, they do many things. But one, uh, they were some papers, and I said, I get fascinated, so I want to do this. So there was no lab in Africa. I established one in Ethiopia, and then next I established next another lab in Nairobi, so this is where I am. So then we are working in this kind of science, developing the science for what? So this is, we do, and then we use different techniques, uh, tools. In the wood, it is a, the structure, you see the rings, and um, the kind of carbon they use, the kind of water they use, it is written there. So we use isotopes, oxygen isotopes, nitrogen isotopes, um, carbon isotopes, and the anatomy. Looking at the structure during drought years and wet years, you see the num kind of hole, the circle, white hole? Do you see on the middle picture? There are structures like white uh, circles. Yeah, it's called vessels. This is a tree that uses like straw to suck water. So we look at deeper anatomy, and this also changes during drought year and wet year. During wet year, it gets bigger, and during drought, it has to shrink. Otherwise, it will die because of hydraulic yeah, uh, failure. So this adjustment we also look at. So do you know about the, how the isotopes work in the plant? So plants. There is heavy isotope, there is lighter carbon, right? So the carbon-14, we use it, it's radioactive. We use it to determine the age of the tree. For example, Professor, you said there are about 4,000 years. If, if it is, then we use the carbon also really to be sure if it is 4,000 for older. But the stable isotopes like carbon-12 and carbon-13, they tell us a lot about physiology, ecology, and what have you. Because plants, they prefer the lighter isotope, carbon carbon-12, and they discriminate the heavy carbon, carbon-13, because do we prefer heavy food or lighter food? But we prefer normally, and also because of diffusion as a leaf boundary layer, carbon-30 is really slow to go inside the stomata, so it's discriminated by about 4.4 per meal. And inside, the ribisco, that is the enzyme that for photosynthesis discriminate it, because it's heavy to digest, less it put it as, uh, simply. And then, during drought years and during wet years, you have different isotope uh, value. In terms of water, water is also 
depending on the origin, on depending on the altitude, depending on if it's groundwater or if it's rainwater, it has its own signature. And we can use sap water sap from the xylem, from the tree, and we can tell also if it's drought year or wet year, and if the water is actually coming from where is, you know, trees are very important, important in the hydrological cycle. Yeah? They use water to grow, but also they transpire water, and then that becomes condensed in the, in, and it becomes water somewhere. So they, they are contribution in terms of uh, water can be quantified using oxygen isotopes as well. So this is, so in dry years, there is high enrichment of the 18O, the heavy isotope of oxygen, and in the wet year, there is a depletion of the 18O, heavy isotope. Lighter isotope. Okay, so we look at the wood, we take samples. I cannot go to sort of how we do the sampling. If you are interested, I can talk privately. So go on. You, we use mass spectrometry, isotope, isotope ratio mass, mass spectrometry for this. And we collect samples from the field, it can be from dead wood, looking at the whole disk, go on. Or you don't have to kill the tree, or I mean cut for the tree. We can take cores, like you see that I'm coring and doesn't affect the tree, then we take that also and study this. So each, so we look at the anatomy, as I said, and as you see, you see the marks, these are called rings. Yeah, so here it is, uh, you asked me about if the rings are showing the wider, uh, wider ring, you see, wider ring, and there are also narrow rings. That means narrow rings are forming a little bit of wood in one year. The wider path between the two rings they form a lot of wood in one year. So there is wide, narrow rings, wider rings, and this, so the narrow rings are during drought years because they are not, they are in difficult situation, yeah? And the wider rings, they are in a good condition. And different species, they have different resilience for drought, that's what I was talking about. Some species, they really withstand this challenge and they can grow better than the others. Yeah, so even if it's a dry year, some species they form better, wider than the others. Some species they die if it's really consecutive dry years. So by measuring, so we have this landscape, you collect samples and you measure the rings from one year to another. By counting the number of rings, you can tell the, the edge of the tree. Yeah, in principle, one ring is formed in a year. And this pattern of up and down would fit if the because of this form drought, narrow rings are drought. So the pattern of up and down would, would fit by measuring it. So there are a lot of statistics going on, and then we develop chronology, we call it. Time series, depending on the age of the tree, it can be 1,000, it can be 300, it can be 40, 50 years, depending on the age of the tree. So by doing this, as I said, in Africa, for example, we don't have climate data. We have about 30, 40 years. There is no meteorology. Also, even globally, the meteorology data, it's not really long. But from the trees, for example, in Europe, they reconstructed 10,000 years of climate history. That's how they know that climate is changing, yeah? By looking at the past, past climate reconstruction. And then if the change now going on is because of human being or if it's because of natural thing, you need to have data. So looking at the back is really critical. But in Africa, as I said, we have only had about 30, 40 years. So, okay, climate change. And the data is also important to make projection, scenario building, yeah? It's based on the actual data that you can project what will happen in the future. Without data, it can be anything. So by doing that, we reconstructed here 350 years of climate information for Eastern Africa. Yeah, so you see, this is precipitation for data we reconstructed. And when you look at the up and down, there was even in 1800, there was also drought events. Somebody was asking, okay, drought happens also in the past. Yes, it was happening in the past. But the frequency and intensity in the, after 1980 is increasing from six to 10 years it's now every two to three years. So if you put, if I could draw a line here, there is no trend. But in climate change, people look at trend. But that's not the only thing. But we have to look also when you talk about where you construct climate change uh, impacts as event-based, yeah? 
So extreme event-based reconstruction is also critical. And this is also related with El Nino and uh, really uh, remote ocean atmospheric circulation interactions. So you see the trees are really very important. Every tree can be a meteorology. So it's not only that. We reconstructed 350 years of data and the spatial correlation, it's really a positive correlation along the Sahel bed. So I was talking about this green great wall planting. It makes sense because this part of Africa is really influenced by this similar atmospheric you know, pattern. Then plants, trees planted in Ethiopia, they will have positive influence also along the Sahel bed. Also, we did, I did sampling in Burkina Faso, the same thing, with temperature is negative. So this also shows a large scale atmospheric teleconnections. This is really very important. So we also talked about is the climate changing. Also, it tells you there are climate deniers, but the trees showed us clearly that the change is because of CO2 fertilization. You see, we measured in Africa, in China, all over the world, there is a declining trend in carbon-13. CO2 is increasing in the atmosphere, but carbon-13 is declining because of fossil fuel burning. And because of the carbon that they use, this, they are fixing that carbon which is declined by carbon-13, and it's marked there. So, Esther, can I intervene here for a minute? Because okay. I find something very interesting. Uh, there is a group of people who thinks that decarbonization is not possible by capturing CO2 and injecting into the deep saline aquifers underground. So, there is a group of people who are advocating more forestation. Now, there are several questions where I think that you can be a very nodal person as far as environmental geotechnics practices are concerned because you have the background of the forest uh, sciences and where we are going to apply them in environmental geotechnics is decarbonization, collection of CO2 from the emission points, which seems to be a very big question mark, very expensive. If I go for the forestation at what cost, what area is required, whether countries can really afford this or not, when industrialization is at its peak, I think we can't afford even a square meter land in any country, in the regions. So this is something now which is becoming a sort of an interesting philosophy. I would like you to write something on this because, uh, as I said, the pretext, uh, decarbonization, how? feasible or not, at what cost. Second issue is what Erwin and others were discussing about uh, decontamination of the polluted soils. I have an industry where I am disposing the waste and this waste is going in the subsurface, groundwater. One of the techniques could be phytoremediation. Now the question is whether I am going to champion industrialization or whether I am going to champion forestation in the industrial premises. I hope you are realizing our concerns. Yeah, yeah, I mean... Uh, what so, to do, how yeah. to move ahead. I think this is where I think I will require your, your inputs in the form of a technical article which would have a much value. Because yeah. you are the person who understands the forestry in the best way. Thank you. I and mean, we are going to apply your knowledge in our subject. Yeah, so this Urban is the carbon that yeah, I I understand. Yeah, yeah. So, very good. Like what I'm trying to ask you a question is whether we should afford more forest forestation. How industrialization would happen? The, excellent. The additional thing that she can do for us, and I think with input from the appropriately qualified folks here, is some sort of write up on using trees to scale geo environmental transitions. Uh -huh. Correct. Yeah. Let her let her lead this that in our group. Good, so Using trees to scale geo-environmental <laughs> okay. Yes, good. and then you have to bring in a lot of information yeah. from your background. Please help us because we have no answer. I hope, uh, Theo, would you like to say quickly something on this? Because I'm trying to interlink her specialization in, our, in the application of our subject. You are a specialist, yes. 
But yeah, that's a that's a big topic because we can be talking about bioremediation, but then there is always an uh, an economic cost, and it will never be fully uptaken unless the benefits outweigh the um, the upfront and the ongoing costs. I can see how forestation actually can uh, can work in a, in a large scale because the benefits are multiple. But it's something that we need to be both aware of and address in anything that uh, that we propose. Yeah, I think, as I said, the challenges are many. It's not only the carbon, this food is important and all that. So as I, these trees are multi-purpose. They give us fully, food, fully uh, biomass. You are in the den of civil engineers. Yeah. So the den of civil engineers, what we are doing, we are going for reforestation, yeah. construction, yeah. industrialization. How are you going to balance this? Yes, uh, Dr. Lunga. Thank you. As you are discussing, a lot of questions are coming into mind. From the presentation, it's like I'm looking, uh, we are just saying trees. Are we looking at indigenous trees? Are we looking at yeah, I will come to that. Trees if, I could, if I could finish, ah, okay. then I will come to that. So, I mean, this is the Sahel. I, maybe from people from Africa, you can see it here. So... People are talking about the Sahel is getting wet, looking only about 30, 40 years. This is from trees, the data. But you see the middle is of the whole the narrow part. This is a long Sahel drought period. It's clearly indicated in the tree. So sometimes I get worried because, okay, if you look the past 40 years, you can, you can think that it's getting wet. But there was also past wet events past in time. So cycle, it could be periodical, long drought, you know, and long. It's different from East Africa. The East Africa, the interannual variation is higher. So it's also different from region to region, and the trees are responding. So. Okay, so this is published in Nature last year. We are looking also what affect, you know, the tropical trees is the dry uh, yeah, season climate is also important. So when the trees are stressed, the carbon sequestration that we are talking about can also, you know, getting low. So we need to find also the resilient trees. They also provide kind of early warning signal. So we look at different species, be it exotic species, indigenous species. So which species are going to survive? We prefer the indigenous, of course, because they are more resilient, we think, and there are also exotic species that are really important for fruit and production and all that, we combine different species and we select different species. So we look at the rings to uh, select important species. And we look at the adaptation of, you know, co-occurring species. As I said, this is indigenous species. You asked me about, um, this is acacias, for example, balanitis. These are indigenous species. Even with indigenous species, some are resilient, some are sensitive. For example, like Acacia Senegal, you know, it's more sensitive than Balanites Aegyptica. So not only the indigen with indigenous, there are also drought tolerant. So let, let me, let me pitch in again. Uh, as, as environmental geotechnologists, we have several applications of trees. One is stabilization of slopes, which Apniti is going to talk about. Decontamination of the soil and the groundwater, which Theo is going to talk about. CO2, which is a major concern right now where we need your help. I think these three things which come to my mind. There could be fourth one also, which I don't know, we have to think about. So can you please take lead and, and guide us and our journal in such a manner that your subject expertise becomes very useful for our applications. Thank you. I think this is what my submission is, and I think I, we will approach you for this. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. I just want to show you. Also, it's not only drought. Flooding is a problem in Bangladesh and all that. This is from our study from Bangladesh. Also, you can look how the species are reacting to flooding. So those species that they are not really, they are plasticity to change is really important. And we use isotopes and anatomy to look at, and we characterize species, not only drought, also flooding. It's a signal. It's a and also groundwater fluctuations. So we, when we plant trees, if we select the species only that uses soil water, shallow roots, then they will compete each other and they will die. And we look at where is the water coming from using the oxygen isotopes, and we characterize. We don't need to dig and look at. And this is very important, especially for the um, green world. 
I am worried maybe they, you know, the water, groundwater will be depleted. This is very yeah, so this is also one important point that we need really to look at in the African Union this is the people. So this is also another aspect, not only are the carbon, also the groundwater. Next, about CO2 increase, it is, as I said, CO2 is increasing and the plants are responding to that. They are water, increasing water efficiency is increasing. So maybe about forest fire, you were talking about, when you look at what will happen. This means the trees, they transpire water when they fix carbon, right? So this intrinsic water efficiency is a trade-off between carbon gain and water loss. So that means the, the plants are closing their stomata. They need a little bit water to fix the, um, the same amount of carbon. So this is changing. So this means the atmosphere will get dry. So that means if the atmosphere you know, is getting dry, fire frequency will also increase. Yeah, so again I'm coming to the point that if you can quantify all these things, climate change related to desertification of the regions, where environmental geotechnical practices could be useful yeah. would be something very interesting. Yeah, so this we don't know what's going on, nobody knows. It's mm -hmm. just increasing. What, when it's going to stop, what will happen? Of course, we don't know. This is a new phenomenon. So we install different um, instruments and we monitor different trees. This is in China. And we look at the soil water, uh, you know, different tools. So, so we look at from the atmosphere, the tree, to the soil all of that, and this is really very important. And some of you, you do soil measurements. This is also, we do this, yeah. So this, it measures every 30 minutes what's going on in the tree. This can be a dendrometer. So the other point is that urban trees, uh, you know, you can also look at the pollution, yeah? Using the combination of isotopes and elemental analyzer of these different elements there, we look at the trees also, you know, the, there are different species for this against pollution also. They are morphology. Huh? So we have to also select the right species for pollution and for climate change, for urban trees. This is new. So this is also another area I think that we can do with you together. So about the science, you see globally, this is a labs uh, globally. You see very, we have six labs, two of them are established in Africa in uh, very few in India and in Latin America, but in America and um, Europe have, for example, uh, more than 17 labs in Germany, but the whole continent we have only six. So this is a science that we are developing, as I said, in the tropics, it's new. In terms of publication and data, you see the data gap in, uh, in uh, so. tropics and in temperate regions. So this is the land that we are trying to restore. You see it's dry and all that. We start from the social aspect, and we also use, as I say, people should be at the center. We Good. discuss with them, otherwise it will not be acceptable. And we discuss where to plant what, and really mapping system characterization, participatory visioning of their landscape. So what to plant where. It's not only just planting trees, but we have to know what to plant where. So this mobilizing people, you saw this degraded lands can be we use different techniques. It's not only planting trees. It's also stopping the erosion. So we mobilize people, we stop the erosion, we, yeah, mountains, degraded mountains like this. You look, Professor, here it is so empty and we do terracing and all that. This is Good. also the science that you are, we need the, your experts in this kind of stuff. But the physical structure is not only stuff, enough. Vegetation, physical, is not only it's good, it stops erosion, but it has to be stabilized with vegetation. Yeah, so we do this, and in dry areas, we also water conservation techniques, we plant trees. Then this whole process takes time. This is after 13 years, you see the stabilization. Vegetation coming back. The soil is, depth is increasing. Yeah, and this check dams and all that stops erosion, and this then comes the water after 15 years, water regenerated. So when you ask the farmers, they will ask you, okay, if you restore the landscape, it's like putting your money at a machine. You put the money upstairs, up, and then you get the harvest down. So now irrigation is continuing and all that. So it is possible to restore land, degraded land, degraded stops, but it takes time, investment and patience, and the right method. Just a quick question on this. So yeah. when you say 
uh, land the degraded land can be restored so does it mean that if there's already some construction which has happened on that like for example an abandoned industrial site can that be restored as well like it's full of concrete and mining areas can be restored uh, industrial but it right. that needs different approach you know so what is the point urban planners uh, engineers you should consider trees as part of Im important infrastructure in your design this is important for climate smart cities and uh, community engagement uh, leadership in and education uh, interdisciplinary approach is really critical and there are Action is needed, of course, to stop this climate change. Thank you. <laughs> now, a couple of things which I will reiterate where we need your help. Plantation of trees in the terrace form in mining area is not possible. Look at our problems. Your knowledge we want to apply in our subject, provided it is feasible. I am doing deep mining for which benching is required. I want to stop soil erosion. I want to make slope stable. I want to create an, an environment which is lush green. Unfortunately, I can't do it because mining requires deforestation. One question. See, oh, I hope you are realizing the brainstorming session is on. How I'm going to utilize your knowledge, expertise. I hope this point yeah, is very important. Yeah. So you are championing forestation. I respect it. But again, I'm saying most of the countries and the continents are developing. How this contradiction is going to be overcome is a major issue. I think with this, I'll close this. Uh, uh, Yusuf will contact you. What we want is, we want a thematic paper on this, answering all these things, and please champion it. You be the leader of this group. Thank you. Anybody who wants to join, yes, please. I wanted to make a quick point, and, and the key is the trees and every species have been found, finding their way through evolution the survival of the fittest, yes? Us as humans have been sort of messing it up, but the solution may be convergent research. To see and convergent research doesn't mean that you say, you gotta plant the, 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 the same trees back where they are, because tree, trees are finding the different ways and different species are replacing. It's finding a compromise between what Professor Dian Singh says and what you said. Everybody should find a compromise that survives so again, the key is convergent approach. Exactly. Not everybody says, I want what I want. Maybe the miners should find a different way. Maybe different plants should be, could be found. Yeah. Something that would work. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what evolution wants us to do. Thank you, I think, uh, Dr. Esther. Uh, this is a contemporary thinking uh, on um, you know some of the techniques what you have used in the dendro chronology to characterize the trees and then to identify the rays and isotope analysis. So many things, uh, you know, which are quite relevant to the characterization of soils as well. Uh, in the perspective of, for example, we are talking about the pollution due to the anthropogenic activities, but I'm not really worrying about anthropogenic activities. Sometimes natural scenario also cause some pollution. For instance, emission of greenhouse gases from the, some of the wetland regions is one of the prominent area where the greenhouse gases do emit. And then contamination of the ground waters by the natural leaching out phenomena, sometimes, you know, arsenic and something. Given this kind of a context, do you think that we can able to really propose, you know, identify by looking at the soil analysis at the across the depth? Can you able to really say that how the emissions are going to change over a period of time from these natural scenarios? Right. I don't want to use from the trees, but, you know, from the, from the, soil, also, yes. from the soil, can we able to really, you know, it's in line with, you know, Professor Hillary's uh, you know, ideal, yeah, the transitions, just try to impose and then predict it, how, you know, the emissions are going to change from this region over a period of time, given the climate change. So I think that would be, you know, the maybe needed. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's give a big hand to Esther. This is, this is going to open up a very new debate in uh, the realm of environmental geotechnics, I hope. Uh, all of you will appreciate. So this is going to be a big theme on which we'll be working under her guidance. Yes, Theo, please. So thanks, everybody. Like Esther, I'm coming from a slightly different uh, position. 
Um, my main area of uh, concern is, uh, is water um, and water from a health perspective. Makes sense. We've been talking about uh, PFAS and the only reason that we care about uh, PFAS is because they're bad for, for us. They're bad for the environment, but more importantly, they're bad for the people. So if you make the connections, everything comes down to, uh, to human health. And um, just to give you a bit of a background of uh, where I'm coming from, uh, my institution is the Institute of Environmental Science of Research, and these are the four major areas that we are focusing our, uh, our research. Um, extends from public health to forensics, some cool CSI stuff, uh, food safety, and the environment. Where I'm standing and the team I'm leading is, it's, uh, is actually the Water and Environment Group, where we are actually looking at uh, health effects from, uh, uh, from pollution coming from uh, the water and the general environment. We've got a radiology team, we've got a Pacific uh, uh, team that works with uh, Pacific communities, we've got a drinking water team, a, a biosolids and circular economy team, etc. It's quite multidisciplinary. It's about 35 uh, scientists on, from all levels, from very senior people down to um, very capable uh, technicians. We've got, because of the variety of the things that we do, we've got state-of-the-art uh, labs, both in the forensics and the environment space. We've got uh, quite a few PC2 and PC3 labs where we can actually work with, uh, with live viruses, doing experiments uh, both on the uh, surveillability and uh, in the transport of those. And being a government-owned institution, but not part of the government, we are actually uh, covering the whole um, realm of uh, uh, science and uh, research and science delivery, starting from uh, detection, uh, doing uh, national-wide surveys on, uh, on quality and uh, state of the environment, to understanding and providing uh, actual uh, solutions. Something that uh, we covered, I think, the first day and um, became a, a point of discussion is uh, policy and how policy actually is meant to be driving the research we do, the impact we make, and how we approach certain uh, problems. And that's the experience from, uh, from New Zealand. Um, it's a recent policy that came into effect, I think it was... Uh, early 2020, um, it's called Temana Te Wai. Uh, Temana means the, the life, uh, Wai is the, is the water. And it talks about how the, um, the water resource is meant to be, to be managed. And it um, actually takes a more holistic uh, approach of the, of the water. It's, it's not treated as a resource that uh, we can use and as long as we dispose of it uh, safely, we're fine. It's meant to be taking into account um, the consequences on the, on the health and the well-being of the water, as well as, uh, as the people. It's a completely different uh, perspective, which actually has the policy makers and the policy implementers, which in that case is the, is the local government, a bit uh, perplexed on how to do it. But there is a very strong focus on actually engaging with, uh, with the people, engaging with, uh, with the public, making them understand what the issues are and how decisions are going to be affecting the state of the environment, the, the health of the environment and uh, the health of the people. And uh, going back to the previous one, it's a, big a big part of that is actually the, the communication and uh, how you bring people, being uh, indigenous communities or the general public, into the, into the discussion. Um, and something that we engineers uh, seem to forget is that nobody is an expert in, uh, in our field. I'm surprised that if you talk to, to people and you try to get from them what do they think that groundwater is, 99% of non-professionals that are related to the, to the topic will think that once you put a hole into the ground, you tap into something that looks like an ocean or a big uh, river that you can pump water. Um, it's, it's amazing, the, the, and that's not related to the education or the social status of the, of the people, it's mostly around their area of expertise. Something that people do not see, they don't necessarily understand, so it's a big part of how you communicate your, uh, how we communicate the research if we are to be making uh, any impact. And now to the more technical details, I'll be talking about a lot of, about drinking water, which is a big topic of uh, the, the work that we do. And 
we don't necessarily understand it, but it's not uh, drinking water quality and safety. It's not a, um, a niche area. It actually affects and, uh, the, the global population. About half a million people every year die because of uh, unsafe uh, drinking water. And that's not an issue only on the developing uh, world. It's a problem in uh, the more advanced uh, countries. Just in 2022, we had uh, over 900 notifications of uh, something is going wrong with uh, with the drinking water supply. In uh, 20 something, yeah, 23 cases, uh, pretty much the, the supply was uh, interrupted before uh, we could figure out the, the source of the contamination. And and when we talk about uh, contamination of uh, of water, we need to understand that water is a living organism. There is biological activity. There are things there that have both good and uh, bad purposes. Even groundwater is uh, not sterile. There is a huge variety, whole ecosystem of uh, things that live there. So if we are to actually try to protect the, the groundwater quality, we need to know what's there and uh, uh, when um, the water becomes unsafe to actually be able to say what the, the problem is. So we work, a big part of uh, what we do is uh, genomics and uh, metagenomic analysis. I'm not going to go into the details. But what we do here, we extract DNA from the, from the water supply and uh, we try to figure out what sort of organisms uh, live there. And you can go anywhere from, uh, from the organism kingdom down to, to specific uh, species. Again, without going into too much detail, the whole idea is to try to understand if there are sources of uh, microbial bacteria. Usually would be fecal uh, signatures from, uh, from animal and uh, other sources. A big part of uh, the explosion of uh, metagenomic analysis is actually related to the, to the cost that uh, has been dropped uh, dramatically. From 2000, when the first uh, human uh, uh, genome was uh, sequenced, costs have dropped uh, quite substantially. And that's actually the cost for human genome, which is extremely costly. If you only look at the parts of the genome, costs uh, are of the order of a couple of hundred uh, dollars per, uh, per sample. So that analysis is actually quite, uh, quite cheap, quite efficient, and gives you a lot of uh, information. And now the, the question obviously comes to, so what's, how is that relevant to geotechnical engineering? And I'll be talking about some work that, uh, that we did on actually trying to quantify the risk from uh, contamination from, uh, from drinking water. And remember that uh, New Zealand is a country the size of Italy, but with a population of um, roughly Denmark. It has way more animals than, uh, than people. It's a very heavily agricultural uh, country. There is not much uh, industrial pollution, but uh, uh, nutrients and pathogen pollution is uh, widespread across the, the country. It's also a very highly productive uh, country. So every square uh, foot of uh, land actually is uh, worth a lot. And any decisions that uh, are being made uh, need to counteract the cost of potential restrictions that uh, are being put into the, the land. So we're trying to actually quantify what's the risk from uh, microbial uh, sources to a drinking water supply, which, I mean, for a typical uh, groundwater engineer would involve trying to simulate the, uh, the path and the, and the fate of uh, microbes from the source, which is on the surface, uh, to the to the well screen. That's all well and done. You can uh, do a lot of work. You can assume uh, loads. You can assume uh, what's, uh, what's happening on the surface. You can simulate unsaturated flow and transport. You can do the, the fancy stuff that uh, Hillary likes with uh, Monte Carlo analysis, heterogeneities, everything else. For that one, we actually had to develop an analytical solution so that we can make the tool available offline. And the end result is um, potential uh, concentrations at the, at the source. If you have multiple sources, you can put them all together. That's all good. Pretty much what uh, you end up is uh, something like that, which is the probabil or the, the probabilistic distribution of uh, microbial contamination at uh, the screen. But what's important here is the so what? Will that people make sick or not? Because few microbes never had anybody. It's uh, quite common uh, the water to have something uh, in it. It's a living organism as well. 
But the important thing here is the, is the red line that comes from what Hillary described a couple of uh, uh, days ago, which is the dose response function. And it's actually how much a person can tolerate. It has to do with uh, how much, in that case, water you are drinking, what's the concentration, so what's the loading uh, that, the organi organ um, that the person is uh, getting from the pathogen. It is very pathogen specific. It has to do with the exposure time, which usually for uh, pathogens is uh, quite small. But depending on the source, that can also be uh, in consideration. And that seems something quite uh, difficult, but it's something that uh, food safety people use quite a lot. It's their bread and butter. Uh, the moment that you ask uh, a, food and safety a food safety person the so what, they do have the answer. Which brings me to the uh, point that uh, we discussed a bit later, how important it is to actually be bringing multiple uh, disciplines uh, together. Because you can do a lot of uh, cool stuff, but uh, things become much uh, cooler when you actually bring the, the right sort of people. Actually, this uh, tool now, just in New Zealand, is having more hits than the local Christchurch uh, newspaper uh, per day. It's uh, way more popular. And again, on topic, talking about uh, working with uh, other disciplines, I'll be talking about some work that uh, my colleague Li Ping Pang has been doing for the last almost 10 years. Uh, where she's trying to, to develop pathogens, uh, surrogate of uh, pathogens, to actually assist us in understanding the, the dynamics of uh, pathogen uh, transport and uh, survivability. The whole idea is that you can create something uh, synthetic, that it's uh, manageable, uh, safe to work with on the field or the, in the lab, uh, that will have the same characteristics as the actual uh, pathogen. Uh, this is something which you do not understand much. Mm -hmm. So I would like uh, you to educate all of us on this topic, uh, migration of pathogens and viral transmissions yep. through groundwater and the sources, why? And industrial pollution. Yeah. Okay, please. I'll be talking about a bit of that in a, in a, in, in a few slides. Pretty much we are concentrating on something that is of a particular interest. So we are trying to, to mimic the behavior of a cryptosporidium, which is a very dangerous pathogen, uh, protozoa that's found in uh, drinking water. Uh, you cannot kill it with uh, chlorination. You cannot kill it with uh, UV treatment. It's extremely persistent. Rotavirus, adenovirus, etc. They say uh, quite a few applications. And the, the whole process is using something that is uh, quite uh, biodegradable, environmentally safe, and that shows promising uh, characteristics. Then do, then do a lot of uh, magic uh, uh, biomodification, again, at the, um, uh, at the atomic uh, and the molecular uh, level, encapsulate it with, uh, with uh, DNA, synthetic DNA, so that it's uh, traceable, encode it uh, um, so that it has the, the right uh, surface uh, characteristics, same, uh, same uh, sizes, hydrophobicity, uh, zeta potential, etc., so that it behaves in a similar manner. Um, and the applications can be quite extensive. For example, here, uh, what Lipping was trying to do is to mimic uh, Legionella particles and their behavior in, uh, in pipes. So how they attach and detach in, in pipes and how they get uh, transported with, uh, with uh, drinking water. Again, on a variety of pressures, it, it can become a very complicated exercise. Sorry, this is for the pipe, so this is for the... That particular one, we are using porous Legionella. Porous media. We are using Legionella for the, for the pipes. We are also doing the same thing for, uh, uh, for pathogens that are more relevant to, to porous media. Uh, cryptosporidium was uh, one of these, uh, adenovirus was uh, another one, and uh, norovirus. And another thing, you can expand that so to I, pretty I, much I anything. I'll give you some idea where you can take the lead. Most of the landfills in the countries are emitting all sorts of leachates. And most of the leachates are bioactive, apart from microplastics. I think this is something which has to be disseminated properly in our subject. Mm -hmm. 
So please do this. And I'll talk about how we're actually dealing with uh, with that. Again, we can actually try to mimic the, the pathogen uh, behavior and how they are uh, moving, absorbing, uh, uh, absorbing into the ground, yes. etc. But we can also do that to simulate the solute uh, transport into into the aquifer. So for which, your information, Dr. Shashank is into biosorption. And I think uh, both of you can work together, Leeds and Christchurch University. Yeah, yeah, I'll be glad to. And we can actually use it so that we can generalize much better what's uh, happening in uh, um, in ground in uh, in porous media. And we actually did test that uh, last year. We still haven't uh, written that uh, that work up. Where we're using one of our experimental sites, where we have it uh, heavily uh, instrumented with uh, monitoring arrays, where. Uh, over the years, we have actually done quite a lot of uh, work on trying to quantify how pathogens and uh, microbes are moving into, into groundwater. Okay. Um, most of the time, we've been using either uh, surrogates, MSFAS2 is uh, safe to use and mimics the behavior of other pathogens. We have been using uh, um, solute uh, traces, we have been using salt, heated uh, uh, thermal plumes try to understand the, the complex pathways in, uh, in alluvial gravels, which have some very, very strange uh, characteristics when it comes to uh, transport of uh, pathogens. So what we did last year, we injected three different uh, DNA tracers because they are in, uh, encoded with a different DNA signature. You can go back and uh, with a single sample you can get three breakthrough curves uh, from uh, from each sample because now you can you know where the the source has been based on the DNA that uh, you are detecting. And the other extreme benefit is that these things are you can injecting you can inject them in extreme uh, high concentrations. We are talking about ten to the twelve, maybe ten to the twenty CFUs per milliliter and they are detectable at extremely low concentrations. So you can be looking at uh, removal uh, rates or uh, log reductions well above uh, uh, 12 or 15. And the detection is also very, very sensitive, which means that it's uh, very, very accurate, uh, which is not the case with uh, any of the traditional uh, traces. And that can tell us a lot about the, the velocity, the transport uh, velocity, the transport uh, um, uh, patterns, etc. And based on that, I mean, I also try to include some, uh, some ideas of uh, what needs to be done next, because we know all, uh, all that work has already been done, but uh, what's important, and two things come in mind, as you said. Natural attenuation, how much uh, of the pathogens, how they behave, how they are being uh, transported, and what's their fate in the, in the groundwater environment. Because there is die-off, there is filtration, there is sorption and uh, absorption. It's a very, very complicated process that uh, the, uh, the data we've got uh, now are quite, uh, quite limited. There is a lot of uh, second guessing or trying to uh, extrapolate uh, lab experiments that do not uh, generalize too well on, uh, on uh, field sites. And that's something else that uh, that you are doing. It's about a, a, an AI, a fully parameterized AI model that it's based on uh, deep learning, uh, generative AI that actually uh, works and uh, we try to simulate a contaminant path uh, transport, uh, at this stage only uh, advection dispersion, on a highly heterogeneous porous media. And that's only one of the applications that uh, we are working on, but I thought I'd put it here as a, since that's a brainstorming session, a couple of ideas that are popping out about AI and uh, potential uses. There is a variety of problems that uh, AI can be, can be applied, it can be extremely helpful tool if it's uh, designed uh, correctly. Uh, and especially with uh, deep learning, it generalizes very well to to areas and data that hasn't been tested. I don't know about, about the potentials for uh, developing solutions for extraterrestrial environments, perhaps. Uh, another thing, though, that we need to be a bit uh, aware of is uh, responsible AI and just the notion that AI never makes mistakes, that's dangerous <laughs> by itself. But we can learn from other disciplines as well. Uh, for example, chemistry or uh, um, 
companies that develop uh, chemical pro uh, products or uh, in uh, medicine and in the creation of, uh, of drugs. They use AI as a uh, surrogate for lab experimentation, so they generate uh, potential um, compounds that may have uh, potential to, to work before they go on to lab. So perhaps that can be another uh, solution to uh, actually try and test the feasibility of creating uh, new building materials, new uh, geomaterials for, uh, for applications. Just generate some, uh, some ideas of uh, what could work, what uh, couldn't, and then test it in a real life application. I'll be moving to circular economy, and that's uh, some of work that uh, uh, one of my colleagues, Olga, has been doing the last six years on uh, microplastics. She's been, uh, we've been uh, publishing uh, some uh, papers on, uh, on our journal about, uh, about the work that uh, she's been doing. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, about, again, microplastics. I think that has been covered a bit. We've been actually detecting microplastics in the even the remotest uh, parts of uh, New Zealand, uh, both uh, marine, terrestrial environment. And that's a, an ongoing thing. Microplastics are not going to go away. They're going to stay with us uh, for a while. And you can find them in, in, even in uh, living organisms in the sea, obviously. The, some of the cool stuff that uh, we, have do, we have done Next one. is we try to find potential mechanisms for uh, biodegradation and bioremediation. That's some experiments that uh, we've been doing in uh, uh, wastewater oxidation ponds and also in uh, marine environments, trying to see what sort of uh, microbial activity starts and how it affects the, the, the microplastics, their integrity, trying to find potential uh, pathways for uh, bioremediation. Which actually brings me to uh, the big thing about uh, microplastics. It's uh, pretty much three things. How they degrade, uh, how you can uh, remediate them, potentially bioremediate them, and the easiest one, how to reuse or uh, repurpose them. That's, uh, for me, it's the, the big topics. We also do a lot of uh, work on uh, uh, biosolids, um, use of uh, wastewater from, uh, from treated, treatment plants, but where uh, we see that our research is actually going, is trying to find uh, ways to increase the value of uh, biosolids, because there is so much uh, land application that, uh, uh, that you can do unless you've got something that it's uh, very, very intensive uh, agricultural uses. There is not much that uh, you can apply. And then on top of that, you've got issues like PFAS that uh, uh, all of a sudden and after a few uh, decades that they've been around, people realize that they're actually a huge problem. Uh, which creates a, an issue, so what do you do with, uh, uh, with biosolids? So trying to find technologies that can um, minimize their volume, uh, increase their, uh, their value, for me is a critical thing of uh, what we need to be uh, doing as a, as a profession. As I said, I mean, reducing their, uh, the volume is a big part of uh, what you need to do. It's all about efficiency and uh, how it's being applied before we try to get rid of the, of the byproducts. Something that uh, is uh, um, around that reuse uh, um, idea is some work that uh, we've been doing at uh, ESR with, uh, with the collaboration of uh, a few universities from, uh, from New Zealand and uh, Italy on how to use, uh, uh, find alternative uses for, uh, for rubber. We've already had uh, some, some ideas about that, and that's actually that's an ongoing topic that uh, uh, people are trying to find smart ways to reuse the huge pile of uh, tire waste around the world. We've been looking at a slightly different approach, how to actually create a seismic uh, isolation foundation system. Being in New Zealand, it's all about uh, seismic activity and improving seismic uh, performance. And we've been looking at the whole uh, range of, uh, of problems, uh, starting from the geotechnical uh, performance to structural, to environmental, uh, etc. And it's easy, I mean, talking to, we are um, all civil engineers, we understand how the what the geotechnical applications are from uh, such a system. You can do all sorts of uh, lab analysis, you can uh, pretty much determine that uh, your thing actually 
outperforms everything that everybody else has uh, seen. But what seems to be often lacking is to actually go have a, uh, a further look and actually try to see what's coming out of that uh, system. And then saw that there is quite a lot that uh, um, are coming out. And uh, my colleague at ESR has been doing a lot of uh, leaching analysis of uh, what is expecting expect to be leaching from uh, from the rubber tiles, tires, and also from the different uh, hydrogeochemical environment that is being created. Uh, so there's additional things that uh, will be leaching from the naturally occurring um, gravel. And that's something that we need to be um, be fully aware of when we are actually looking at repurposing or reusing material. What's the environmental effects? What's the um, what's the safety concerns around these uh, these materials? And the other thing is, we need to be to have a plan on how to scale it and what the large scale applications effects are uh, are going to be. And going to agricultural contamination and nutrient contamination of uh, of groundwater, I'll be talking about two um, trials that uh, we've been uh, we've been doing. And that's an in-stream um, denitrification uh, bioreactor. It's meant to be removing nutrients from, uh, from surface uh, water or from uh, groundwater that has been removed from the ground through uh, drains. It's an existing technology, very well uh, uh, proven. It works. Uh, the carbon that's released uh, has its microbial activity. Microbes take out uh, hydro uh, oxygen create an anoxic environment that uh, stimulates the, uh, the growth of uh, bacteria that will take up uh, nitrogen. But uh, turns out that working with uh, the microbiologists in, uh, in our team, we figured out that that, uh, that type of uh, technology not only removes quite a lot of uh, nitrate, it uh, also has the potential to remove other, uh, other pathogens as well. And we've been doing a lot of, started doing uh, some experimentation on what actually gets uh, gets removed um, uh, in such systems turns out that uh, microbial removal is um, is uh, quite significant and microbial loading on uh, surface water systems is a big health and safety concern also on the same uh, uh, aspect we've been trialing another technology that it's very well proven in a, a completely different environmental setting usually that uh, technology has been uh, trialed in uh, sandy aquifers so low permeability material where there is a lot of uh, residence time within the same uh, carbon uh, material in that case uh, wood chip you put that into into the ground you let uh, groundwater flow through that uh, and again, that actually stimulates the same uh, processes that first take out the uh, oxygen from the from the water and eventually take up uh, nitrate. That uh, that system has actually proven to be the most efficient uh, uh, nitrate removal mechanism uh, reporting the literature so far. The the aquifer system actually is extremely permeable in that uh, setting. We are talking about uh, transport velocities of uh, up to 100 meters uh, per day. That's on, a, on the natural uh, gradient, and even though the um, the the concentration, the nitrate concentrations are not that uh, great. We're talking about six to eight uh, milligrams per liter, which for some of the U.S. colleagues that says, so why do you bother? But it turns out that the amount of mass that is being transported through the system is uh, is amazing, and we did a lot of pre-design work. We tested what the hydraulic permeabilities need to be so that we can match the permeability of the wall to the aquifer. We tried to create a gravel and a wood chip mixture that will have a conductivity of about 30, 20 to 30,000 meters per day. We estimate that the aquifer was of the order of 10,000, so we thought we would be uh, nah, uh, fine. Just to quantify and uh, see what the performance uh, would be, we did a lot of uh, um, time-lapse uh, hydrogeophysics, injecting salt, trying to see what the, the plume looks like, uh, some fancy uh, modeling involved, just trying to quantify what the, what the plume looks, uh, looks like. We used the results of uh, the, uh, the hydrophysics to inform the flow and transport uh, model. So we did all the, all the fancy stuff, uh, gravity dependent flow, highly parameterized uh, inversion, where you try to actually find the dynamics of and uh, quantify how much of 
nutrients are moving through the wall. Turns out that the reality was uh, very different than uh, than the design, and that's not too. Uh, it's not very surprising. You don't obviously you don't see the uh, the nice Gaussian plumes that uh, you would expect in that uh, setting. There is highly preferential flows, and I'm not going to be showing any more results. But we did that with uh, multiple point injections, and every single one was uh, telling us a different story. Despite that, the technology still works. It's uh, still the most efficient way to remove uh, nitrate from uh, from groundwater. It's extremely economical on the long term. It turned out quite costly to install it, but uh, the huge benefit, and that's what got us the funding to actually trial the, um, the test, and that goes to uh, the comment uh, that uh, DNS made to Esther, is that it doesn't take up any surface uh, space. So cows can roam freely on the top of the, of the bioreactor. That means that compared to a wetland, which is a more traditional solution, takes pretty much zero space. You can make it as big as uh, you want. You can live into the ground. Turns out that um, five years it will still work. Are, are, are these something like uh, PRBs? Yeah, ah. but it's a uh, it's specifically designed to to remove uh, nutrients. The idea is taking actually um, so for the reactive basically base. PRBs to bioreactors. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and the take home message: we need to start thinking about large scale bioremediation. The, the problem is uh, here, it's one of the greatest problems that uh, uh, we have to deal with as uh, groundwater quality professionals. It's widespread, it's uh, considered one of the uh, top uh, priorities around the world as a uh, problem to, to tackle. Uh, and there is a lot of uh, contention between uh, competing groups in uh, New Zealand. One is the, the, the tourism industry that actually wants a pristine image of um, of uh, New Zealand with beautiful waterways, everything green, everything blue, which doesn't work too well with uh, the interests from the uh, from the farming community, which want uh, as much intensification as uh, possible. And just to to conclude, I'm going to go into the climate uh, change uh, question that uh, DNS made uh, yesterday. Obviously, it's a it's a game changer. This. Nothing's going to be different uh, when you start uh, uh, considering climate change. And that goes from uh, uh, the simple hydraulics, recharge, flash floods, uh, droughts, uh, soil moisture, how the pretty much anything. Uh, poor water, slope stability, whatever you we think of, it's uh, going to be affected by, uh, by climate change. But that's not something to be looking at uh, necessarily as a problem because it creates so many opportunities for, uh, for our profession. It needs to be something that we should be looking at as an opportunity, uh, trying to come up with, uh, with new solutions that uh, will work. Because no, no matter how much uh, carbon we sequester, climate change is here and it's going to stay with us. The data are there. I mean, uh, you ask the question, how do we quantify climate change? And the data are there. Uh, there is global models of uh, how the climate is going to be changing, how what's going to happen with, uh, with the weather patterns, then becomes a, um, a question of how us as a technical uh, discipline adjust these uh, large global scale models and uh, make them relevant to our applications. For example, we have been working with a couple of other agencies in uh, New Zealand trying to see what climate change would mean with, in terms of uh, groundwater recharge uh, and uh, infiltration from the surface mm -hmm. into the soils and to uh, the water table. So we've got a research project right now that actually tries to quantify what that would mean for, uh, for safety of uh, drinking water and also for uh, groundwater quality. Uh, again, it's all predictions, nothing is uh, certain and needs to be considered uh, carefully, but the data are already there and we know that uh, that's happening, so we need to start uh, preparing for that. Ah, yeah, and the other thing is that we've got uh, an upcoming themed issue for environmental uh, uh, geotechnics. It's all about climate change, nothing else. Um, so any um, big themed papers, um, uh, think pieces, short notes, short papers, applications. Videos, videos also. Videos. That we, yeah. Greatly, uh, very, very welcome. I think the deadline for uh, abstracts is uh, early February or end of February. So a couple of observations to keep Arvin 
and uh, some of our uh, contaminant transport people. Arvind, you were talking about THMCB yesterday. So many of us do not really understand uh, the coupling. Another question is, Theo, you are an expert in groundwater. Uh, Arvind is an expert in porous media. Now what we have to do is, we have to marry these two. Otherwise, this goes into the domain of groundwater and some of the papers are being rejected by EBMs on the pretext that this is a groundwater related work. Now my point is, what I am trying to tell them is that look, soil is the main cause. Exactly. Otherwise, groundwater cannot become polluted. So somehow this thing has to be cleared. I don't know from uh, Sridip or some uh, working in the field in the area of uh, contaminant transport here, Dali Naidu. So I think yeah. you three, please sit down and then maybe, yes, please. About the role of trees in groundwater recharge. I mean, how do we... Yeah, that's, a, that's a good because point. Because trees are really critical in the hydrological cycle, be it, be it groundwater or river. Uh, yeah. Because interestingly, in uh, Canterbury, where uh, we are situated, a huge agricultural area, you are not allowed to be planting a tree because takes water from uh, from the aquifers that have been over allocated for uh, for irrigation again it's a matter of economics and actually trying to get the public to understand what the actual problem is yeah it's about planting the right tree at the right place what i said if you plant maybe trees like eucalyptus of course they yeah. take much water at the beginning. Exactly. But there are other species, the right species for riverine areas that can be planted to recharge more water. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a big one. Yeah. Now a, a question I have is uh, that the, the world, the universe is deterministic. It's just there's so many factors we don't understand, so we treat it as a chaotic uh, system, and in a chaotic system. So, I mean, obviously, there are singularities in the physics-based models, but I believe still physics-based models are, are, are the best predictive of the future, uh, as opposed to AI that, or, or any other method or empirical that relies on the boundary conditions of the experiments or the training of the AI. So this the AI model that you were talking about, what were the boundary conditions that were used for the training? Uh, it's pretty much... Good point. It's uh, quite simplistic if you look at it from a, from a physical-based uh, problem. So we're talking about uh, um, gradients that are quite typical for the New Zealand environment. You know, constant uh, boundaries that uh, create a, a, steady, a steady gradient. It's meant to be a proof of concept, that it's something that, that it's doable. And what we are actually, where we are now, we are trying to use very few training uh, data to actually be able to make the, the model fully parameterized. So one of the parameters that uh, you would be able to assign is some description of the, of the boundary conditions. Uh, that being uh, retards, uh, water take, uh, water retards, um, uh, gradient, etc. It's still not physics based. It, the the training data are physics based. Oh, the training, so they but, are. But exactly, be if that if they are physics are based, Arvin, then they cannot be chemistry based. No, no, but I mean chemi chemistry. Chemistry is, is, is oh. uh, molecular scale physics. Yeah. So the so, one, the, exactly. Well, well, that is the future of the subject. So I am coming to this point now. AI, to many of us who are conventional. Mm -hmm. is still a big question mark. Yeah, and that was the reason I, pu I put it there, so that a bit of an idea of uh, what can be done. Because uh, another thing, we are actually building AI models to predict uh, chemical heterogeneity on a national scale. Very good. We did have localized uh, models uh, for specific so regions. Can, 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 you can, can one of your colleagues uh, do this? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yes. So AI role in environmental geotechnics, I have been discouraging, to be very honest. Now the question is that if you are going for multiple attributes, how are you going to put them in an intelligent database, which exactly. is going to give you an answer, well, this is what is happening. 
So somehow, please break the shackle. And that was the, the point I made about uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies. They do have all that, all these huge databases of uh, what its compound can contribute uh, to, the, to the development. And that's, that's how they actually get uh, AI models to synthesize virtual drugs and select the, the ones that look more promising for, uh, for lab trials. Excellent. So, yes, that's reduce the number of uh, bacterial experiments. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So, Shashank, you'd like to say something because you were doing DNA sequencing when you were doing PhD and uh, not successful. Uh, Shashank is there? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, would you like to join this team of uh, Arvind, Theo, yeah. others? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Because uh, in fact, I had one question uh, f for Theo on this. So when you're monitoring the uh, pathogen migration within the porous media, uh, especially the aquifers, uh, are you also able to monitor the uh, migration of spores within the porous media or? Depends on the, on the transport characteristics and uh, whether they can be transported with uh with the groundwater or whether they are actually filtered out by the by the matrix. Yeah, the, so the, the main point was that uh, why I came to that point was because if you see the pore size distribution within the rock mass, then they are much finer than the size of the bacteria or uh, some of the other microbes like fungi are much larger in size. De so. dep always depends on the, on the material though. Because sometimes, I mean, uh, when you're talking about 100 meters per day transport velocities here, you can imagine that uh, you are talking about uh, gravels with uh, quite a lot of uh, pore space. Or the crustacea that I have sown, I mean, these are uh, quite a few uh, centimeters in, uh, in size, and they live happily in the, in the groundwater. It's all about the size and the, and the, pore, or, and the pore space in the, in the media. It's not all about uh, sand or, uh, or clays. Uh, there can be quite a lot of uh, uh, gradation into the, into the spore size. One question, like, uh, do, uh, do you have special temporal distribution of these uh, viruses and pathogens which are existing in the groundwater? Because uh, you were also talking about attenuation capacity of the soil mass. So if we know the stratum of the soil, of the soil mass in a special distribution so can we relate to the attenuation capacity of the soil mass or geomaterial existing yeah because um there is another sort of uh, dna analysis that it's uh, being quite uh, heavily promoted right now it's called environmental dna so by analyzing a sample of uh, water for um for the dna you can actually tell which environments the groundwater has been through because all living organisms, are, they die off, they are setting DNA. So by making the connections or uh, trying to correlate the DNA that you are founding with potential sources, for example, you know that uh, some species only live in the Vadozon, or they need a specific uh, type of environment to, to be living in. If you find DNA of that uh, species in your water, you know that at some point, uh, the water came through that uh, environment. Depending on whether the, uh, the DNA that you are collecting is either active or inactive, you can actually tell how recent that, uh, that was. There's a lot of cool stuff that, uh, that you can do. And we've got another project that we're actually trying to get the funding for to actually build a database, the interactions between different species at the molecular level and how they, these interactions relate with uh, with hydrogeochemical uh, conditions. That's, we are combining physical modeling with, uh, with AI on that, trying to simulate this, uh, these interactions, but it's, uh, there's quite a lot that uh, you can do. So I, uh, I, I'd like to raise a question that about the very intricate detail that impacts the big picture. You mentioned that model that you had, and the, the numerical model showed something that was totally different from the reality. It doesn't mean that the numerical model was wrong. Exactly. There, are two, there are actually three drivers for that. Now, when you have, now back to what Professor Dian Singh mentioned is, we do have a fully coupled model of groundwater flow with PFAS transport. Yeah, yeah. 
The problem we faced, because PFAS is obviously absorbs to the air water interface, the problem we face is this. When, when you have two different governing dominant physics at different scales, when you go through the transition, you face instabilities. Examples, you go from laminar to turbulent flows, you see instabilities at the interface, which basically we cannot simulate. We treat them as sing singularities, and, and we cannot simulate. The, the same thing goes from where you're going from uncharged particles moving through this medium. Amphif amphiphilic, yeah. hydrophobic, you go into hydrophilic charged particles and so on and so forth. At the interface, such as PFAS, a lot of other things show up. So where, where things are, like at the moment, our groundwater flow at the larger scale is, is beautiful and it's working perfectly. But when it comes to the air, air, like you know air when it flows through the soil, the suction, the pore size, the porosity controls. You could have channels, you could have you could have bubbles of different size, you could have different preferential paths, and that's where we're still struggling. That the AI, AI I don't know if it can help or not, we're still still struggling, and that distribution would fully control the flow. And and we cannot to date fully predict preferential paths. That's where we need to push. Exactly. That's the cutting edge that's missing. Exactly. When it comes to, to the ground water flow. Obviously, heterogeneity play, plays a big role. But there are points that even if we know the heterogeneity, we cannot find Quantifying the transport. Uh, is, that is one of the cutting exactly. edges that we gotta, we got to work on. And, and the other thing, with, with pathogens, I think that instability at the interface will happen because they have negative charges, some, I mean, they do have amphilic, amphiphilic. Clogging dynamics. Clogging dynamics would make things difficult, change the pore size. We do have all those different tools, that and connection and the instability at the interface, that at the transition, the transition that you were talking about. <laughs> That's the cutting edge that, that the entire scientific community is stuck at. And what's also a bit tricky is that the, that interface and the behavior of that interface can be different for different organisms because of the mm. different characteristics, different sizes, physics. different shapes, different uh, charges. It's back to physics that what uh, yeah. DMS mentioned. It's is, not only the physics, yes. Yeah, yeah. No, no, what, what I mean by physics, I always say that when I teach computational courses, like, Physics is mathematics, chemistry is molecular physics, biology is biochemistry. So everything goes back to physics and mathematics. So if we know all the governing equations mm. and unified ways that can capture the transitions, a numerical model should be able to capture all of those. Very good. That, that field, exactly. even though as advanced, and you, you, you refer that to sophisticated, Okay needs a lot of improvement. That's where we need to push. And a lot of people are, are running away because it's just too complex. It's for too them. complex, yeah. But, but so, it's not but if, if good. we go back yeah. to basics. So Shashank, I think you should lead this. Shashank? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think please lead this. Be in touch with these two stalwarts. Sure. And then I think we can go ahead and mark your presence. <laughs> Thank you very much. Nice. So, Apiniti now, please. Good morning, everybody. Once again, thank you, Professor DNS, for inviting me to give a talk. So, the topic of my presentation will be on nature-based and smart technology for sustainable slopes in Thailand. I'm from Thailand, Kase Saj University. The outline of my talk, uh, I will start with why we have more frequently slope stability problems, erosion, and I will then introduce the practice of bioslope stabilization we do in Thailand, Excellent. try to answer some research questions, as well as some practical needs. And I then will showcase the field monitoring, uh, some data of uh, performance of bioengineering slopes, also showcasing the, the newly developed smart IoT monitoring system based on some real uh, landslide case in Phuket. And then we'll conclude with some possible outlook to be in line with the, the theme about the uh, bio circular economy and that stuff. Ah, next, please. Yes, yeah, let's go on. Can, after the outline, let's check if this is the correct file. Ah, yeah. So we have more frequent uh, extreme climate leading to severe drought, forest fire, landslide, and erosion. And on top of that, 
we have the needs for agricultural land for food security, and there are some issues about the land scarcity. And in Thailand, we have slash and burn practice. I mean, as a result of uh, mono crops, cash crops, also leading to the air pollution, PM, and so on. And this indirectly affect you know the uh, geotechnical work, traditional geotechnical work like highway and roads. So geotechnical engineers are more familiar with the hard engineering structure like short grid, but we can see that it's not always the best solution. So I think the best way is to combine this structure with plans. I think one of the main drawbacks for conventional structure is, is too, too rigid. So we need something more flexible, more like a nature-based solution. So just to outline the, how modern soil bioengineering in Thailand has developed. So uh, thanks to King Rama the Nine, actually whose birthday was on yesterday, just coincide with the soil day. Uh, he he in, in introduced a vetiver grass system to Thailand. And since then we have used quite a lot of vetiver engineering, bioengineering, and there are some gas pipeline projects in Thailand that we uh, rely on this vegetable grass, jute soy bag, and live stakes. So right now we use quite a lot of the different erosion control blankets and flap soy bags, and also incorporate it with some uh, my micro pies and some new in innovations. And there are some important research questions that we are trying to address, like the species we use for these plants. We consider the uh, relation of these plants to the water pressure and suction and how to quantify this vegetation effect. And I think this is the main issue in uh, a geotechnical engineer because we are more used to like a concrete that we can exactly quantify the, the properties. But for plants, it's more va variables and it's in the uh, Vados zone, it's in unsaturated zone, so it's more tricky. So my research is aimed at this sort of thing and to ma maximize the uh, benefit of the plants in with combined it with engine structure. So the research approach, we, uh, sorry, this corrupted here, and we, we combine a few observation, laboratory, test, numerical uh, modeling, and of course we have to rely on the empirical. So, and for bioengineering, it means local wisdom like uh, uh, other local people would know what kind of species that are suit suitable for some places. Uh -huh, some uh, basic governing equations. So when we look at the root soil mechanics, so we have the unsaturated seepage, so the continuity equation, unsaturated flows, and for the uh, reinforcement or the contribution of plants, we can consider in terms of shear strengths, and there are two parts. The first part is uh, me mechanical uh, reinforcement is CR, root cohesion. Another one is a uh, hydrological reinforcement, which can be through the transpiration, evapotranspiration, that tend to reduce the, the, the pore pressure. But there are, uh, there are also other effects of the plants that can affect the in infiltration as well. And if you look at the, the, the pioneer work in uh, root reinforcement by Professor Wu in 1979, so with this simplistic mechanistic uh, the model that we lump all this effect into the root cohesion. But you can see that the root cohesion will also depend on the moisture condition in the soil. So it all depends on the interaction between the roots, which is under the tensile condition when the soil is, uh, is cheered. So we try to quantify first the life stakes in the soil. So using the large direct shear and test the uh, soil, uh, sorry, the plants of different ages in both unsaturated and saturated condition. And in the end, we have developed, uh, next please. Uh, this is uh, the result that we find that. So now we could quantify this root cohesion of the plants at different root contents. So we can quantify the root contents in various ways. Firstly, is the, the root area uh, ratio on the sides, and another one is the root content. But root content can be quantified in the destructive uh, way only. So we make use of the root area ratio, or RAR, and we find that the, the dysfunction also uh, suction dependent. So it depends on the moisture condition. And with this, we can extrapolate the, the knowledge of the dysfunction of the root content and root cohesion in the field by first looking at what happening under the ground uh, near the root zones. So we use the mini rhizotron, and we could obtain the, the variation of the root content with times. 
And with this, we can try to correlate what happened above ground. So the um, canopy uh, ratio with the root underground as well. So which means that we try to extrapolate what happened in the roots and the grounds above ground. And maybe in the future, we try to use the remote sensing, you know, to quantify the root effect underground. Next, please. So this shows some of the example, but this work is quite uh, um, tedious, you know, because we have to sketch all the roots and the grounds, and then we have to calculate the root area ratio, and then from, the RAR convert to root cohesion and then to factor of safety. So in the future, we could make use of the AI or something like that, you know, to uh, aut automatically convert from the root cohesion uh, to factor of safety. Next, please. So another thing about the, the optimum suction, because if you want to maximize the, uh, the benefit of the roots, you know, we can try to introduce some uh, drip irrigation system irrigation system. So this is the example of the, the test that we quantified optimum moisture condition. So we did some shearing tests on the uh, wet vegetable, uh, reinforced soils, uh -huh. and then at the different moisture condition, we find the, I think the optimum value of suction is around 20 kilopascals. So this is a condition that is not too dry and not too wet. And another thing is about the hydraulic behavior of the this uh, bioengineer slopes. So the the benefit of the vegetation on slope is very clear. I mean, one of them is the uh, interception of the rainfall, and then the evapotranspiration that reduces the water pressure. But there are a number of uh, contradictions in the the literatures about the per permeability of these plants, uh, rainfall soils. And we find that for the, it depends on the age of the plants as well. So for the uh, mature plants, we think that the, the rooted ground has the higher per permeability. But for the young and actively growing plants, all these roots actually will occupy the macro pores and it will reduce in, uh, it will result in the lower per permeability. So it depends on the, on the plant age. Uh, how, however, we find that uh, from a geotechnical engine point of view, if you have the increased infiltration, it may reduce the runoff, but we don't like it too much because it may increase the water pressure and then subsequently destabilize the slope. So just to uh, showcase some of the findings we found in terms of the unsaturated hydraulic properties of the roots and forest soils, so we see that uh, we can see the influence of the soil type, the root contents and the plant age. Uh -huh. And we did this test in the lab and also obtained the samples from the field of the bioengineering slopes that has different uh, age, ages. So with these uh, understandings, we extend that to numerical analysis and find also that is the, the boundary condition problems and the benefit or the limitation of the, this plant-based technology depends also on the gradient of the slope as well. So for the, uh, the field slope gradient, typical field slope gradient, so about one vertical to two horizontal, uh, the mechanical effect of the roots actually more than offset the potential higher infiltration due to roots. However, for the steeper slope like a 60 degree cut slope like that, please please, the factor of safety could be potentially uh, reduced due to the uh, pathway of this, you know, atom water due to the roots. So it depends on the slope. So which means that we cannot rely on the plants alone, but we need the structure that is more environmentally friendly and is low cost and appropriate technologies. So one of the way that we use is uh, what we call flap soil bags. And flap soil bags uh, actually in Thailand was used, uh, made of this HDPE mixed with the PP materials. So we added UV resistant material. So with the expected design life of more than 15 years. So with the connection between the bags uh, using the flaps, the, the frictions are enhanced using the sur surcharge weight or from the adjacent bags. And some full-scale friction tests from the laboratory show that, uh, yes, the friction angles or the pull-out resistance is enhanced about three times. And just to show you some of the community-based uh, kind of uh, project that we introduced soy bags, 
with the plants next please this one is in the northern part of thailand so i think we discussed yesterday about the issue about the dredging so i think it's also a problem in thailand because in thailand we do a lot of the dredging and this dredge material i don't know uh, it cannot be disposed of very uh, straightforward so they just put this dredge slopes on uh, the dredge material on the side of the slope just waiting for the next flood to come and then yeah, the dredge will come back to the, the river. So we try to introduce this uh, a nature-based solutions, but of course using some existing engineering hard structure like a KPN with the flap soil bags. But these flap soil bags was actually uh, with some joy vegetations, big bags and so on. So this kind of technique is quite la labor intensive. So as you can see, so it may be appropriate for a uh, developing country countries like in Thailand so it's good for the society as well to a certain extent so you can see that we at this project we use the fresh cutting of live stakes and the survival rate for this project is not very good it's about 30 percent of the plants survive from the cutting uh, from the live stakes so uh, in the sub subsequent uh, project, we actually wait for the live stake to grow, maybe put in the, the nursery for one month for it to root first. But you can see the, the outcome of this bioengineer project is very contrast with the, the traditional concrete structure on the right. So this plant is uh, Bougainvillea, and you can see many in the tropical countries. And of course, with the quantification of the roots underground, we could quantify the root reinforcement from the root area ratio and then convert that to the factor of safety. And now we extend that work to the the hilly uh, terrains, but this time we use the mi micro pies because we see the, the limitation of the plants alone that may not be able to extend the root deeper quick enough to arrest the movement. And of course, I think we know that the, when we use the plants, people start to question how to quantify such effect. So I think the continuous monitoring is very Im important to uh, um, guarantee the, the performance of such bioengineer slope. And there are some concerns about the microplastic as well. This just shows some preliminary results that we have to simulate the intense environmental effect on the, on the plastic bags itself. So we use the UV lamp and then uh, expose this to the uh, intense wavelengths. And then we find there are some uh, the minimum uh, leaching. So, and we, we think that, you know, there must be another way also to reduce this uh, my, microplastic, you know, in these hill, hilly slopes. So we're looking at the biochar bio as a soil amendment for the soil bioengineering. Because when we extend bioengineer to the, the natural slopes in the ag agriculture land, it's a large um, area. And uh, there were some issues about the open air burning of the agriculture uh, the residues like cro uh, corn, corn crops in, in the northern part of Thailand and not just only in Thailand, I think in Laos, Myanmar as well. And uh, we actually introduced the farmers to turn the these corn trees, corn plants after the cultivation to the biosha. Bi but one of the constraints that the farmer has is that they don't want to transport all these, you know, corn trees to the, the burning um, place. So, but we could see that there are already some uh, gully erosion, the eroded uh, the channel on the hillside. And we could try to, uh, to modify or make use of this by just, you know, putting the flap soil back, making a check dam, and use that as the open pit burning so there is a, a technical term, I think it's called flame curtain, flame curtain kiln. It's a way to cause the pyrolysis reaction for the bioshars. Bio and there are some study that the pollution that caused by this kind of uh, uh, open, the flame curtain burning pit like this is much less than if you actually burn the whole place, you know, like using the slash and burn. And on top of that, this what we call by Ocha check dam can also serve as the you know surface water fil fil filtration as well. And we try to encourage the farmers to use this practice, but it's still hard for them to change something you know that their way of life. So we try to add some economical uh, benefit for them. 
as well. So we en encourage the Department of Highways to make use of the by by OSHA. So we introduce a capillary barrier system for them that they could be used as a way to reduce the erosion on the back slopes that ultimately lead to the the big land landslides. Firstly, make them you know just use a tree cutting from the landscaping you know along the sideway of the high, high highway in Thailand, and the uh, Department of Highway staff can actually earn some uh, money by selling you know this by by OSHA back, and also the uh, the farmer can sell this by by OSHA mat material to the DOH as well. And I think by OSHA could be a very uh, simple and convenient tool to offset the ca carbon footprint. <laughs> So according to some earlier study, well, I'm not an expert on this, but what I see is that one kilogram by OSHA can potentially absorb 3.6 kilogram of CO2 from the atmosphere. So I just calculate my fry from Bangkok to Mumbai. Yeah, so when I go back, I need to um, I'm vary about 280 kilograms of biosha in the soil when I go back home. And just to show some few observations of the soil moisture, suction and movement in the cornfield, because all these highway development uh, projects were actually carried out by the non-geotech. Non so they asked us about, you know, how their technique, you know, kind of regenerative agriculture can help to, uh, to, help to fix the landslide problems. So we're looking at investigating the benefit of the vegetable system from a geotechnical or geoenvironmental point of view. Mm -hmm. So we selected one of the players that they use the vetiver system for soil and water conservation and we install some in instrumentations uh -huh. so to look at the change in the soil moisture in the ground and the water pressure and also looking at the surface movement we see the potential of the you know vetiver system to conserve the soil and and uh, water so it maintain the soil moisture condition to the optimum uh, con conditions and uh, the movement is actually very well arrested by the vetiver systems. Uh -huh. So despite that, you know, there are further, there are induced infiltrations around the vetiver system. But the, the geotechnical stability is not com compromised, let's just put it this way. And just to show some of the example of the project that in Thailand we have, the try to look at the Highland Research and Development Institute or HRDI has done quite a lot in the past through the Royal Pro Project works, uh, works. I think firstly, I think they need to introduce the water resource development to in introduce the people to start changing their way of life, to change from the slash and burn. I think one of the crucial starting point is the, the, the water. So there are certain systems that they fund, they give funding to the local people to dig, excavate the um, water pond on various hilltops and with the piping system, they could actually divert the water from the, the hills up slopes to these different ponds. And with this, they can start to change their way of life by changing from mono cash crop like crop like corns to uh, avocado, uh, the mangoes, and so on. So this is like an agroforestry uh, practice that they use. So the impact is quite ob obvious here, as you can see. Now I I like to move on to uh, another different area, which is on the IoT technology. So you can see that this instrumentation in geotechnic is not new. So we have observational method and so on. But I think the, the key message here is that we need to have the timely display or the clear representation of the instrumentation and the results. So we see that the IoT technology can be, I mean, a very good way to address these needs because we can show the data in the real time manner and these are some of the examples that we developed in Thailand. So with a tensiometer, piezometer, soil moisture, and in place in kilometer, we try to combine all these uh, measurements and come up with some overall warning index. So just to showcase this, the event in, lands, uh, in Phuket, there was a landslide last year that, I mean, uh, greatly affect the, the main route. I'm not sure if you have ever been to uh, Patong Beach, you know, it's a very uh, pop 
popular tourist attraction in in Phuket, and there is only one main route to go to that beach. And once is uh, there is a, a landslide, you know, there are a lot of pressure from the the business um, sectors to reopen the the road. However, the Department of Highway is re reluctant to uh, uh, re reopen the road. So we need some data-driven insights for the traffic ma management during the ongoing slope stabilization because they are constructing the berm. So it takes time to uh, filling and compacting the berm from the uh, lower to the upper part. So the work has to be done very swiftly. So we went to the size work at night and so on with my staff. Then we need to choose the critical location on the slope. However, you know, due to the the danger, you know, of the traffic still being on and on, so we could only choose the load location of the slope installation on the back, and we install piezometer, tensiometers, and so on. Just to sh just give example of the warning events, I think it was it happening for only for a month time. But during that time, one month, I sometimes got a phone call at midnight to ask me what happened to the slope because there was a, a, a heavy rain on ongoing. So I have to have a look at the Adam data and tell them what uh, happening and so on. So there are some warning events that are quite interesting. So because there are a lot of pressure to reopen the road, so I think the, the governor decided to let the, the vehicles going on that road because uh, before they only allowed the, the motorcycles but once they allow the you know the the vehicles you know to use the road the bigger ones and then there will start to be some sign of movement and that side of movement uh, were ongoing for about one day and we decided to uh, discuss among the, the the panels and then the decision to re reopen the road was changed actually so the public was not allowed to use the road in, anymore so I just thought that with this kind of thing, you know, if we can use the AI, we can actually try to train the AI based on the events like this and then come up with some automatic, you know, so that I won't be interrupted during the night, you know, something like that. And now the next topic I'd like to talk is about remote sensing. Remote sensing, this is the, the area that we just got chance to look at uh, a couple of years ago. So our work is still preliminary. But we use the SMAP Sentinel data and then use this kind of ready-made soil moisture from the SMAP from NASA to calibrate or to validate with the moisture content that we install in the grounds. And we find that the good correlation is observed for the, the uniform land use. So for example, for the agriculture lands in the hill or something like that, I think we can use map. So there's something I'd, I'd like to discuss result from uh, Professor Hill, Hillary uh, from the first day. And he mentioned about this, uh, the assets and so on, the key economic sector, major link, linkage. So I just try to put this in the same con context. So the natural resource we have is slopes and the natural in agriculture and infrastructure. So the system that we concern is the agriculture, farm plants, irrigation, drainage, slope protections. So what are the support system? So we have the, uh, the local wisdom and we need some sharing. We need to share the, the local wisdoms and bring that to the capacity building. And we hope that we could actually turn this local wisdom and so on, of course, with the scientific background to the expert system with some AI and then ongoing train that kind of existing knowledge, maybe with the IoT monitoring system uh, and data as well. So some outlook into the environmental geotechnics or slopes. So I think in the future, due to ongoing extreme climate, we continue to see more soil erosion and land degradation. I think the key is to promote this PPP. I think it uh, stands for like social, economic, and environmental in uh, balance. And then I think if we encourage, you know, as a geotechnical engineer, I think we are dealing with the uh, with budgets. You see, we uh, design stuff, we design infrastructure, and if we can link that sort of uh, work with the com community, so try to encourage. If it's the labor intensive work, I think it's fine because it actually you know give back the uh, the money to the 
uh, the people. And for the uh, technologies, I think LiDAR technology, UAV, for assessment of erosion will become very important to uh, assess the vegetation growth. And I think IoT system will be cheaper and cheaper. And we can try to link this global and local continuous uh, me measurements. And in the future, if we can be successful with the remote sensing, we can extend the, our finding to the, the larger scales as well. And I think regenerative agriculture is very important. And if we can consider that in our next research, it will be very useful. So thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent uh, presentation. This is, um, uh, you mentioned uh, yesterday uh, that the journal, you are trying to look at ways of making inroads into this climate change, this whole climate change thing. But this is one very important uh, sector for it, for this reason. Um, uh, Professor Wu in 1979, you've made reference to him at Ohio State, uh, developed that equation for dealing with the soil reinforcement by roots. But you see, he was doing that on rather site-specific basis. But today, those things have become very relevant because you have now decomposed his uh, composite parameter into a number of uh, sub-parameters that are amenable to uh, distribution on a spatial basis across regions. So this then allows him to use this methodology, but not on a site-specific basis, on a regional basis. Uh, to compute those things, maybe use remote sensing data uh, to supply the, the, uh, those things by correlation or interpretation GIS, and then do climate vulnerability maps that are now uh, based mostly on ecological considerations, not geotechnical <coughs> considerations. So to me, this is an entry uh, of gene geotechnical engineering Correct. to prove its utility to climate change for vulnerability assessments on a regional basis. Correct. So Apniti has to take a leadership role. The one is, uh, I really liked your word, bio-circular green economy. I think, uh, I am sure that no journal has come out with this type of a themed issue. So the title of your theme issue can be Bio Circular Green Economy, Apiniti. Sharat, you can help him. You are working in this area. In the meantime, I have circulated one picture to the WhatsApp group. And the most challenging task which we are facing is doing vegetative cover protection for natural soils is very easy. I have shown you a picture where these are extreme soils. The basicity is 13.5. The red color soil which you are seeing is bauxite residues, in which Sarath was also involved. And ultimately, this system failed, causing huge damage to the ecosystem and maybe some people and they, they lost their lives also. So the question is, oh, okay, okay, let's not make it a debate point. Now, the point is, uh, one, all of you who are working in this area of uh, vegetation-induced soil reinforcement, the challenge would be extreme soils, tailings, how to, you know, uh, stabilize tailings. That is what is required in a country like India. We want solutions. So, Apniti, if you can take uh, maybe care of these two topics, biocircular green economy yeah, and definitely, yeah. stabilization of extreme soils mm. with the help of vegetative covers, including landfills. That is going to be something very, very intricate. Thank you. Other yeah. You've forgotten the vulnerability, uh, climate change vulnerability. Sure, that also can come here. Yeah. Apinit, uh, just a quick question. Uh, noti I noticed that he used this uh, plastic sacks uh, to hold the soil. Mm -hmm. in, in Europe, we are worried about using plastics, uh, 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 plastics. Uh, for solution like geosynthetics 
Hydroplast. for stopping soil erosion. They are promoting nature-based solutions. So I don't know whether you try to look at that, whether you could use other options which are nature-based rather than using this uh, plastic bags. I think, uh, yeah, that's a tricky question. But the thing is, uh, most of the natural fibers are, you know, not very long-term performance point of view. There is a questionable uh, issues. So by the time the slope may not be stable, but, you know, uh, repetitive corrections need to be done on a quite number of times. That's yes, a, uh, that's a I agree. And I think we know that when I did masters 20 years ago, <laughs> and we were looking at uh, natural geosynthetics and we are well aware of but i think uh, problems uh, creates an opportunity and uh, we should look at so we know that uh, there is a challenge but can we find a solution and uh, in norway we actually develop a product uh, based on rocks basalt based geosynthetics possibly you might have heard of uh, could be used for this. The challenge with that is uh, is the yield capacity that it has uh, is uh, very brittle, so it cannot take very large strains. But in applications where we don't encounter large strains, could be could be an option for erosion cover, not for stabilization. Based on this presentation also, because they are talking about like two woody and the herbaceous. So far, when you are talking about this type of uh, shrubs, its depth is only certain depth. I mean, maybe 2 meter, maximum up to 3 meter. If there is a shallow feller or erosion problem, then only this is becoming effective. Yes. If there is a deep rooted failure, so then this vegetation is not becoming effective. Uh, even if on the so that's why now we are trying to, along with uh, a combination of this, like uh, when we are talking about extreme soils, when uh, that is one similar in other type, that means we can say nutrient deficient. So first year we are putting some small grass, it dries, creates some nutrient. Next year we are putting some shrubs, then it dries up. Again it creates more nutrients. Slowly over the years only big trees are coming up. Only when the big trees are coming up, that time the slow, it is helping in stability. Before that, mostly it is helping for the erosion uh, issue. Now, now you are talking about gully erosion. Yes. Gully erosion. Yes. Not sheet erosion only. Uh, no, that also sometimes lead to sheet erosion. Yeah. Because the when the rainwater, whether it is coming as a whole or at certain the, the slides. Shallow, shallow, shallow slides, it can prevent. Drops up to 2 meter, 3 meter, because this, uh, the like vetiver can go up to maximum, it goes vertical and also it has got its own life period. So Maybe. Like what, what you were talking about. So it is the next uh, micro piles or else you can provide with these bags, jute bags. And what you still suppose say when you are having uh, like people are also in, in India using coir, jute, sisal, all these are natural fibers. Mm. But jute is maximum one year. Coir can go up to two years and sisal has got a higher life period. I mean what we are talking about natural fiber. So that way, so this depends upon the growth period of the trees. So within that period, we need to temporarily protect the soil. That time this vegetation is not helping. We need some other treatments. Why, why is it not helping? It, it takes time? It is takes time because? because vegetation, vetiver goes very fast. Yes. I understand vetiver goes very fast. But that also within one monsoon you cannot get it. In the first monsoon itself, you need to protect sir. Yeah. Or that we have erosion yes, that is what is. So that is why always it needs a combination of it. See, it's a need I think, a combination. Sarat, uh, the, the, the photograph which I have sh uh, shown, extreme climatic condition, vegetation yes. will not survive. Yes. The practical problems are, these are hypothetical solutions. Please understand, now we have to practice all this knowledge. When you go to central part of the country in India, temperatures are 55 degree temperature, you know, in the mining region. Which vegetation is going to survive there? So rather than doing mining, now my main focus becomes to water these plants. Water is not available. 
So these are the issues which are of the future. Please understand, we have done a lot of past, present we are doing it, but where is the future? So what we want to do is, we want to be the trendsetters by creating situations where the solutions do not exist. And this is where we are thinking what should be done. Knowledge from plant pathologists, you know, forest guys, utmost of importance because they are going to tell us, look, this variety has to be used at this place under these circumstances. Now, Hillary is asking, what is the problem? How will you carry all these jute sheets in these regions? The mining area where explosives are embedded in the ground. The another, another video which I have shared with some of you, this is a live project which we did. This is a mining area where we have done some patch by using this vegetative cover. Very big challenge. So this is where the answers are required. Sure. Okay, any, yes please. Uh, quick, quick, uh, I mean, just a comment. I mean, these roots obviously help with surface erosion or depending on the depth, deep seated erosions and so on, or gully erosions. But recently we've been working on, on wildfire, post wildfire. And, and everybody thought, okay, hydrophobicity is a big issue and Correct. so on and so forth. But the roots that are still there and, and depending on the fire intensity and severity and the burn, Good. the structure changes so that that will function, uh, performance that they have changes also. So that's something that, that's, that's basically pushing your topic in, into the extreme climate yeah. impact and so on and so forth. Sure. That was comment number one, but something that uh, is also important that sort of relates to that whole question of trees and how do they impact groundwater flow and contaminant transport, as well as the strength of the tree roots and erosion and so on and so forth is, is where we hit again those delicate details that are the holy grails. If you talk to hydrogeologists, hydrologists and soil scientists, one of the holy grails is ET, evapotranspiration. Mm. We keep talking about soil suction and this and that and the uptake. We forget that the structure is not, yes, the soil uh, relies on the so soil suction in terms of the properties and the, and the strength, but the tree shear strength also de depends on what you take down from the atmosphere or how you transpire. And that is one of those points that people rely on just the number, you throw it in there because the physics, it's, it's one of those interface instability or complexities. We can't, still the holy grails. So that's another area that connects what you were, yeah. if we could have a good ET or handle an ET, then we could have the impact of the, the trees on the groundwater flow, and hence coupling it to transport of contaminants would be. In this case, we are once again going towards a unifying model. Exactly. It goes, but it goes, yeah. Everything yeah. goes that, back to this. That we discriminate the on the basis of the circumstance scale. at that location. We need be, trans be, scale, be not multi scale. <laughs> That's yeah. right. Be trans scale uh, extreme yeah. Yeah. or not extreme. So I keep going back to we don't need multidisciplinary multi-scale we need transdisciplinary trans scale exactly so I'm, i also i would make a comment in all of this you say soil water but the trees are really important in all this and i think tree soil water a component and the evapotranspiration and i'm glad <coughs> i attended this uh, i think there are there is a lot of things that uh, we can do together a lot of and we do all this stuff also and uh, but i didn't get all this time and i uh, really the roots and uh, engineering thing will be very interesting for us so thank you very much for the comment just like to add something to address it uh, for the et yes it is very uh, uh, um, uh important and just my one of my colleagues actually in the remote sensing field he actually tried to correlate the et actually with some remote sensing uh, some data i think he correlated with the ground temperature or something like that and it seemed to work quite well actually and all this um, data is actually free you know, you can make use of them. Yeah, it's very yeah they still use some correlations that are yeah. specific to that. It worked for that case. We don't know the physics yeah. fully yet. But one other comment <laughs> on, on a burn site recently, we tried to use uh, drones and hyperspectral imaging and so on and so forth. If, there's, if there was no vegetation, we have a good handle of the change of the properties and the moisture content and distribution and so on. But when there was vegetation, everything was masked 
with vegetation. I, you said you could correlate it. Was it where the vegetation was not existent or were so basically you consider the uniform background. So the signals to, to noise the signal to noise ratio of the change in the moisture content even under the high signal high noise level of vegetation in your hyperspectral image was not a problem. Because we still struggle, it's, it's three. We, tr we tried to publish this three months ago. We probably will struggle for another six months before we come up with a with an algorithm that we could resolve that issue. Uh, they are, they are working with uh, SMAP, and that is microwave remote sensing. So many of the aspects get a uh, hyperspectral has its problem. Oh, but uh, this said is UAV, based on microwave remote sensing. Oh, I, oh, I so walked then, out. Uh, Maybe I missed that, that one. But still, the sense uh, of fusion, right? still it works well with uniform ground. But when it comes to slopes, even the SMAP images has its own problem in understanding the uh, soil moisture characterization. That's what I read. Uh, like uh, I, I've not worked on this, but uh, slopes uh, with vegetation has its own limitations, even when we use uh, remote sensing. So, so you used basic, basically, and 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 back to this whole thing. Another term that's very popular in the geophysics field is sensor fusion. So, which which is the solution to some of these problems? So, so I walked out of the room and I missed that part. My bad. I think for that matter, all of the porous media applications, it's a notional understanding more than highly ac being accurate. I think so it holds good on a regional scale especially. But, but that's the, the error bar. Is it larger than the variations in the average, the whole uh, the signal to noise ratio? It gets averaged out. So. Uh. I just want to just make a comment about the remote sensing. They are great. A lot of data there, but I, also, they are not really perfect. You don't get everything. It's, you need to understand the process and functions. I can give you just an example what we did in Ecuador. We installed these dendrometers and all that, and we tried to correlate it to the NDVI. So it show, shows green and all that, but the tree was not growing at all. You know? So uh, yeah. I think it's we have again to be a very careful challenging. careful about what we interpret. It's a very challenging parameter, NDVI. It yeah. has got its own uncertainties. Very good. So why don't you take lead and write some technical note on this? I'll be very happy to give priority and publish it. Trivialities associated with this type of a treatment and what you are talking about microwave, remote sensing and everything, it should be discussed. Nice. Okay. So Professor Sridip, uh, we'll move on to him. Oh, first of all, just a minute. I'd we'll like to give a big hand to our community. Thank you very much. Yes, Professor Sridip. Good morning to all. So today I'll be discussing on uh, three management aspects. As you can see, soil water management, agro waste and drought management and exploring the nexus, which has got its bearing on many of the aspects that we discussed uh, in the last two days. So this is more like a graphical abstract of uh, what we have been doing. And I'm just showing this to bring out the importance of the role of geo-environmental engineers uh, in this platform. So, as you can see, this is an important interface we are talking about with soil atmosphere interface, where a lot of mass transfer and energy transfer takes place, and which is important for sustaining life on this planet. So this is where the importance of the subject comes, where we are talking about a lot about uh, climate change, global warming, drought. This uh, kind of mass transfer, energy transfer takes naturally. Like, we don't bother about it as of now, but then there are certain anthropogenic combined with climate change which may affect its equilibrium. And this is where the role of geo-environmental engineering would be, how to restore the balance. So the, the, the soil is one of the most important resource which bears the direct impact of all this. As you can see, there are several circulation models in the nature, and one happens to be the soil moisture loss associated with temperature or maybe global warming. So it leads to soil crustacean, poor microbiota present in the soil. And uh, this circulation is what we need to keep in equilibrium for better life. And this leads to the this particular circulation has its bearing on drought erosion, nutrient loss, and enhanced soil salinity. Yeah, clubbed with wildfire soil hydrophobicity, and this results in geo-environment degradation. This is where our role would be more proactively how to conserve this geo-environment. Yeah. If I may intervene, uh, the soil-atmosphere interface yes. is something very intricate and very interesting. 
Yeah. So why didn't you come out with uh, a theme issue on this? Yes. You have plans? Yeah, I have plans. So this is not something that we need to, we can glance through because this is just a summary. Yeah. So there are issues such as uh, the waste coming from various industries related to agro, including weeds, because weeds is a very highly uh, relevant problem in today's world. For example, highly invasive weeds like water hyacinth, which covers the water body. Now, where to dispose this off? Can we make this as a resource? So. And uh, one uh, advantage of agro waste is it is non-toxic. So not, not necessarily everyone, but uh, majority can be uh, classified as non-toxic based on the relevant tests. And there is a huge possibility because according to Indian Council of Agricultural Research report, only 30% of it is reused. So there's a lot of possibilities for startups. And it's not that it's not happening. A lot of startups are there in the agro waste valorization and application sector. So one such possibility is to use agro waste as soil conditions, where the geo-environmental engineering has its role. Yeah, these are some of the applications. Uh, so this is where what uh, my focus would be how to use agro waste as soil conditioners for preserving soil moisture conservation as well as its water retention. So this is uh, a brief on uh, soil moisture and uh, the soil moisture conservation has got its direct and indirect bearing on three of these sustainable development goals. And uh, soil moisture precipitation feedback, it influences essentially the terrestrial water and energy cycle. So it is there and it's very important. And it also negatively impi impacts soil carbon storage, which we talk about a lot these days. And very importantly, it's the biological activities which sustains life on this planet that also gets impacted due to severe loss of moisture. So it helps to maintain uh, optimal soil temperature and for sustaining life. So this is the third one, third aspect where drought, and we don't, we don't, I don't have to specifically discuss this particular aspect. Just to highlight, there are several initiatives from United Nations to deal with uh, droughts and also combating desertification. Now, I would like to specify here, here the desertification does not necessarily mean that completely it is filled with sand or it's it merely means it is barren land, so which is not fertile or maybe not fit for agriculture. So several such efforts are there in Indian setups also, but I would say it is still in, in its uh, in, uh, initial stages. Okay, having discussed all the three, here is the nexus. So drought occurrence next is a soil moisture loss. And this is where we can pitch in, where we try to use agro waste management for the benefit of preserving soil moisture. So it can be used for soil moisture storage and conservation, storage and slow release of nutrients, like it doesn't get washed away too fast, plant growth medium, uh, designing plant growth medium, and various other applications. This leads to soil water management, where we, where we talk about soil moisture conservation, and, and so this leads to soil ma uh, drought management. So this is where we'll be discussing about what is the role of geotechnical and geo environment. Why I'm specifying geotechnical is most of this understanding is based on the concepts of unsaturated soil mechanics. So that's why, so how these two understanding would help us to improve better. Yeah. So these are some of the role, like identification of waste, biomass, weeds for reuse or re recycling. Uh, why we have to, we have to specify this uh, because nobody else is going to do this for us. Even for the synthesis of soil conditioners, we ourselves need to take the initiatives. So identification of optimal application rates. So if there is a soil conditioner, what should be the application rate that will give us the efficient performance? It's more like an optimization problem. Then how does the soil conditioners perform in different soil textures? because it depends upon whether it's a sandy clay or um, any other silty kind of how the ingredients is, how, how it is going to uh, impact the performance. More importantly, soil itself has got its ingredients because it is uh, subjected to various fertilizer additions. So in the presence of this, how does the conditioner perform? That's also an important question to be understood. And for all this, unsaturated soil behavior, in terms of uh, water retention, it plays the key. So how does the soil conditioner engineer? So I would like to stress this particular point 
because we we need to engineer the water retention characteristics and that and not only that how the water infiltrates and how does it redistributes in the root zone that need to be understood in detail and how does it help in nutrient retention because most of the time because of indiscriminate irrigation most of the nutrients leaches down now this is the biggest problem now can we have the soil conditioners in place which will retain the nutrients for a long time in the root zone so that is another important aspect which need to be understood now when you use a soil uh, amendment uh, using some conditioner it stores water but how much of this water is actually available for the plant roots this is not known this need to be quantified then uh, how does this translate to minimizing drought stress in plants which is not understood in detail why because most of the plant physiologists they measure plant parameters geotechnical or geo environmental engineers they uh, specifically focus on soil suction and unsaturated properties we need to club these two aspects together and study in a holistic manner so that is also need to be understood now any kind of conditioner that we add into the soil it's going to influence the soil microbiota are we going to add more problems to ourselves this need to be understood in detail and uh, these uh, conditioners since it is from agro origin it may tend to deteriorate in its uh, and it's not a permanent kind of additives which we are adding it's more like a fertilizer because after some time we need to enrich the soil using fertilizer this also has the same role so we need to study what is the degradation rate of this so all of this has its utility in bioengineered slope agriculture urban green infrastructure combating desertification and many others so these are some of the examples which we try to do like you can something called as this is a the soil conditioner which is known as water absorbing polymers and uh, the generic name of this is either super super absorbents or hydrogels as it is popularly known and this was first developed around 1960s basically from us for taking care of in the agricultural practice but it has it has not picked up that well in the so it lot of research is now going on how to utilize this for arid and semi arid regions so this is a typical uh, you can see a powder like material on the left after absorbing it becomes like a gel and then this is the is a micrograph of that particular material so here the important aspect is high water absorption of this material it is around 200 to 300 grams per gram now a question may arise since it's uh, agro waste why not you dump it directly into the soil yes that's also correct but the amount of water absorption which it gives may be around 60 to 70 so when you transform this material into a conditioner it is going to have 300 to 200 to 300 grams per gram it's a huge amount of micro water reservoirs which i would call it so you can see in the bottom uh, figure when there is uh, rainfall or when you do irrigation this uh, particular uh, material the conditioner it swells it gains water and it gains its volume so when there is a dry spell what happens is water from this material it is released into the soil which the plant can uptake so this is what the mechanism is and in this context now uh, we are currently uh, doing a research on how this is going to impact the tea plantations of northeastern india because it is a department of biotechnology project where uh, earlier days uh, we never talked about water shortage in northeast india it's a highly rain fed area but last 15 to uh, 20 years there are a lot of problems related to water even in the tea industry of northeast india so they wanted to try out this material and another advantage is it's all grown on slopes so where the runoff will be very fast even when you irrigate most of the water goes as runoff so this material will be able to store more, more water into the soil matrix so that is where we are trying out for uh, tea plantations so this is one uh, such work where we have tried to synthesize this water absorbing polymer 
from coconut shell fibers for conserving water in semi-arid region. As you can see, this is the characterization of the material and its water absorption capacity. The right side is the uh, crux of uh, what where we can contribute. This is the water retention characteristic curve for the soils with and without uh, this uh, soil conditioners. As you can see towards the extreme left, there is a, uh, is a drastic shift in the water absorption capacity on the left. And it's enough that we focus on this particular area where agriculture uh, water is basically towards the left side of this curve. So it's a drastic increase. But the question remains whether this water is available to the plants or not. This is another such effort where using three-stage process, we have transformed a non-water absorbing fly ash to a higher water absorbing polymer. Now, the three-stage process is checking the leachability of the elements in fly ash. If it is beyond the limit, how to use sequential extraction, bring it down, use that fly ash as water absorbing polymer. And there are many pond ashes where the important uh, this, uh, contaminants are already leached out. So one can always use those pond ash for transforming. And you can see that the water requirement for the plants, it reduces by around 52 percentage when you use this particular kind of material. That's an uh, important dimension to this particular uh, topic. I've not uh, done anything related to that, but it works. It, it will work. That is exactly the point which I raised. Like, there is a process of degradation that it will be subjected to. And that is basically due to the hysteresis. And uh, we have seen that uh, whatever we have synthesized, it, has, it is staying more, mo mostly around 12 cycles of uh, wetting drying. So it depends upon the synthesis process. There's a huge lot of uh, possibilities in the synthesis itself when you consider superabsorbent polymers. So it depends. And the major uh, challenge is how to bring down the cost. Yes. And this, this as such, it is not f uh, focused for a very large area. When you say that it's a controlled uh, vegetation in polyhouses or greenhouses, this can be a very good option because you don't need much water. So that's it. Apart from the cost also, the question is how would you implement it? See, this is the, this is the, this is the first question. Mm. How you would implement? You can't inject it. Flowability is very less. Number two, rheological properties will change. Now, another problem. Water is required for plant growth. Geopolymer has an affinity for water. It will absorb all of it. Now, how plant roots are going to extract water from the geopolymer itself is a fundamental question. So, there are several questions. We are not uh, denouncing what you are saying. Like, no. These are the questions for tomorrow. Correct, correct. So, please go ahead and keep... Uh, no, I, I, I would like said, to... Uh, yeah. uh, one interesting point is dust suppressant, hmm. which I think we have published some papers in environmental geotechnics. That was related to erosion. Uh, dust suppressant also as okay. a geopolymers. Okay. Uh, in fact, Chinese are doing a lot of work there, you know, tanks group and all. Mm -mm. Yeah. Uh, I think I would like to make a distinction here. It's not actually geopolymer where the water is entrapped. Yeah. No, this is, uh, this, is, this is more like a biopolymer okay. where water doesn't get stored that tightly to it. So anytime you put into the soil, that's why this particular work uh, deserves attention. We have talked about water release mechanism from this material into the soil. is fine. Yeah. Implementation, injection into the N soil itself is a it's, it's not injection, it is powder. So it is powder is mixed with the soil. And it's biodegradable. Yeah, uh, yeah, and it's no, degraded. Just, just a minute, let's, let's go slightly slow. Yeah. Now, suppose there is a soil mass which I want to amend. Yeah. There, is, there are two, three methods. One mm -hmm. is you make a solution, inject it. Mm -hmm. Number two, you take the dry soil, mix it with this powder, relay it. Sloping ground, relaying anything is absolutely difficult. Mm -hmm. So I think these are the questions which you have to address. Uh, this no, is not now. So the, yeah, just yeah. take into account. Yeah, yeah. So this is basically focused for the agricultural soil. It's not uh, for the slopey so, uh, so uh, mass. There has been an instance, Professor Abdul Muhammad, AMO Muhammad, is uh -uh. is championing one themed issue on biopolymers. Yeah, yeah. Most of you voted. Most of you means not you. Most of the EBMs voted against it. Hope you understand. And then there was a lot of debate going on whether we should encourage these type of papers or not. 
So still we are going ahead with this. And the summary was that let's become devil's advocate and try to caution people why it should not be utilized. Because yeah. there was severe yeah. question. Just a parallel thought. Correct. So please, please carry on. Yeah, next. Yeah, this is the water release mechanism which uh, we try to quantify when this comes in contact with the soil. As uh, I just want to clarify one more thing. This particular additive is always in a powder form. Okay. So when you mix like a fertilizer, chemical fertilizer into the soil, it's the same procedure that you, you need to adopt when you mix this into the soil. Okay. okay. So this is the field study which I was referring to where both plant traits and the soil traits were measured and we need to quantify how much the plant do benefit when, when it is subjected to drought stress because of this particular material. As you can see on the left side, this is what is known as photosynthetic yield for the, of the plant. So when it is subjected to drought, you can see that the bottom portion where there is a drastic reduction, where when the irrigation was stopped, it was subjected to drought stress and the photosynthetic yield drastically reduced. And how the WAP it helps it to preserve the water it, it is uh, visible in the particular figure. A, for, for confirmatory, we also measured stomatal conductance of the plant. As you can see, both of them, it matches fairly well. And it is indicative that the WAP was able to enhance the performance of plant growth in such underwater deficit condition. I would like to focus on what are the future research ahead. Yeah, this is, uh, apart from the biopolymer, there's an, another aspect which can be, because biochar is a kind of a wonder material, but then a lot of research has gone in understanding. So the next part of this research would be functionalization of biochar for different geo-environmental applications, where we can still enhance the water storage of biochar through functionalization. Not only that, nutrient retention, Contaminant immobilization, because when you say nutrient retention, it, it is also applicable for contaminant immobilization as well. And the other aspect is carbonation, which I have not touched upon, but it is equally important. And uh, yesterday, Professor was uh, mentioning about, so this is uh, equally imp important for this agro-waste and geo-environment where we talk about life cycle cost-benefit analysis. Quantifying the short-term and long-term impacts on the geo-environment. And this is a very important aspect, like having said that we have uh, done some synthesis, what, how is the, what is the possibility of scale up of synthesis and intense field trials for demonstrating soil water conservation under drought stress, yeah. And this is, uh, this is a need of the hour where we talk about the guidelines, recommendations and code provisions for apl applying and replenishment rate. That's what I meant. Like when it is subjected to degradation, we obviously need to know what should be the replen re replenishment rate of this valorized uh, biomass, which is as such missing in the literature. Quantify the impact of uh, impact on soil microbiota, carbon fixation and carbon credit, which need to be quantified and demonstrating and combating the desertification through field trials. Accelerated enriching of wildfire affected soils. Now, as uh, already discussed, the soil is worst affected during wildfire, subjected to very high temperature. Can we think of a means by which use this particular technology uh, enriched with enzymes for accelerating how to enrich, how to bring back the wildfire affected soils. This is uh, relatively a new topic that need to be researched. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Srijit. I just have a small doubt. Like when you mix this water absorbent polymers with soils, yeah. And when the process starts, there will be volumetric expansion in the entire uh, 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 like soil mass. Uh, what will be its impact on this soil root growth as well as plant growth, and whether it will be a detrimental to the plant growth or beneficial? Yeah, that's a very uh, important question that need to be answered. Because these uh, water absorbing polymers are generally stored in the pores, where otherwise water should occupy the space. So the, the performance of this uh, water absorbing polymer is limited by its swelling within the uh, domain of the pores. So as such it is not going to because plant roots are even much smarter than these materials. So it can sustain and that is exactly what we wanted to prove that 
whether it has got any detrimental effect on the plant growth. And that's what we are doing, a lot of uh, lab and field trials. As of now, we don't understand any, uh, including the microbiota. There are not many negative impacts by using this because most of the materials are non-toxic to the environment. Yeah, in fact, uh, this can be even made appropriate for even coarse grain material like fine sands because this itself will hold the water. And if you engineer it further, you can even induce nutrients into these material. So it becomes a uh, two-way advantage uh, uh, material where nutrients also get released, water also get released in a slow pace. The, those studies are already there. Professor, yes, like, Professor. Uh, what about... Uh, like? effect of permeability due to like in inculcating this type of polymers into it and after swelling if what will be the change in permeability then uh, because it will lead to the in like depending upon infiltration capacity again a very important question uh, why because see this remains in a dry form before irrigation or before interacting with water after interacting the infiltration takes place it interacts it swells within the pores now what we want is this water should be stored there. We don't want deep drainage to take place. So it gets altered. The hydraulic conductivity, which we generally understand as in time invariant, is actually in, uh, it's variant with time. Like uh, the pore structure gets changed. But it is for advantage. It's not for disadvantage. But then again, if infilt or precipitation is taking place, yeah. then uh, it will not let water to seep into the, the soil that is true it may it may result in a bit of runoff but if that is the kind of rainfall that you're talking about nothing can stop it otherwise also it's going to happen that's why on a very large scale this is not recommended yeah uh, second thing is you know suppose if you have a frequent rainfall intensity we may not need this kind of a technology Absolutely. to be that's implemented yes, right yes. Uh, second one is, you know, the rate at which we try to use the, you know, WAP is basically around 0.5%, less than 0.5%. Yes. I is. think in my lecture, I think you will see that uh, where the application of this kind of a polymerized addition for the polymerized bentonites, in other application, you will try to say that, uh, you know, where around one gram of a polymerized bentonite is holding around 700 grams of water. Yeah, so thanks for reminding. In fact, the application of this is in arid and semi-arid regions yeah. where we don't get enough rainfall. We need to store more irrigation water into the system. That is the whole effort. Yeah, uh, Professor Sridip, uh, actually, it's not my query. Just I want to uh, uh, know one thing. You have uh, calculated uh, for beans for 60 days, right? So if when uh, Professor like Danis mentioned that... Um, when you are going to implement in the field, for example, if you take uh, a small area like maybe in this type of uh, this much area, and if you do the time lapse uh, electrical resistivity tomography to understand uh, when you apply this material, so that might be uh, will give some insight for the large scale implementation. Correct. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, the question is whether this is to be applied for degraded soil or natural soil. It has possibilities for both. Like uh, how to revive the degraded soil, it's under, like, uh, I have not done any work related to that, but it's something worth exploring. How this is going to enrich the degraded soil. Let's give a big hand to Professor Sridip. Um, thank you to appreciate my mentor, Professor Hilary, and uh, uh, my host, uh, Professor Sai. Uh, my coming here is well understood by them, and of course, that's going to influence my uh, presentation. Thank you very much, and uh, everybody. Yeah, uh, big greetings from Nigeria, and uh, greetings from my university, University of Ilori. Uh, the University of Ilori is uh, situated on uh, 5,000 modern hectares of land, 500 kilometers from uh, the federal capital city, and uh, 3,000 kilometers from the popular city of Lagos, that I believe you all know. Uh, the university has about five and uh, 15 faculties, of which we are physical science, we are, my department is, Department of Geology and Mineral Sciences. We also have uh, two institutes which couples 
uh, with the endowment of the university in form of uh, department, institute, and uh, faculties. Here, my uh, talk is essentially going to be on uh, what thank you on uh, what I do and uh, my research interests, which has to do with landfill site assessment, uh, use of local materials as barriers in landfills. Uh, with characterization, the technical evaluation of soils and rocks, uh, groundwater vulnerability studies and quality assessment, uh, field of contaminant uh, transport in water system, uh, soil modification uh, uh, using modifiers, different modifiers, some of which we have talked about here. And uh, now I do a, a bit on uh, mine with uh, pollution remediation you see some uh, biomass. Like I said, I'm just talking about environmental geotech uh, geotechnology in Nigeria, the prospectivity in Nigeria. So I'm going to give us one or two, three things that makes Nigeria uh, a prospective place for a study of uh, uh, environmental geotechnology. Uh, number one, we know when we talk about uh, environment, environmental pollution, we talk about three tripod stand, which is uh, pollu uh, our population increase, uh, which I'm displaying here, you will see different state of Nigeria uh, up to 2002. The base is not showing very well, uh, showing us how the variation in the population by state. So Nigeria is over 200 million uh, people now, so you can understand what we mean if you go by, cap by capita rate, uh, waste of generation. Uh, rate of generation by waste. Uh, another factor that is responsible for waste generation is urbanization. Uh, and you can see the consistent increase from 2012 information that we have up to last year, 2022. And you see that it never stopped. So it's uh, diagonally increasing. Uh, the next factor is industrialization. Uh, the next factor is uh, industrialization, as we all know, and from the data that is showing up here, you see that industrial is a, is a major uh, factor in uh, GDP growth almost in every uh, country. Also, Nigeria is not an exception. Uh, you will see the sharp drop there, uh, some, you know, these are some factors, but as we believe, that industrialization is a general factor for GDP growth. Uh, this is typical of uh, what you see in most African countries. This is Nigeria. Uh, you see a lot of waste, and the problem is where to put this waste. I'm uh, talking about prospectivity. Yes, another issue is that Nigeria, the land of Nigeria, every, every state in Nigeria has one mineral a deposit or the other, and uh, especially those ones that are even uh, on the road now in the old world, we talk about lithium. Uh, Nigeria is also uh, one of the repository of most of these minerals. And the problem here is, is the minerals has to be explored. The, the consequence is uh, environmental pollution, water, soil, and the air. So uh, talking about prospectivity. Uh, these are some of the signals that we see. Uh, you see on the top, top left, the uh, deformation of the morphology of the, uh, of the land. At uh, the top right, that is uh, uh, AMD, that is acid mine. Uh, drainage signals, then the top at bottom left, you see gas flaring, and uh, this is, I said, in SS, and that is most part of southern, I mean, south, south uh, Nigeria. The top, I mean, the bottom right, what you see there is the contam hydrocarbon contamination, uh, which is also in the, we know that Nigeria is, uh, is also known for uh, oil and gas uh, uh, exploration. So we have all of these effects on the surface not just on the surface of water, but also on the subsurface. Ah. Uh, so what have I done in a way? I've just, uh, I've started, okay, the colored portion of the of map of Nigeria, you see there, indicates the areas where I have carried out uh, some uh, investigations to the impact of uh, open dump site, I'll call it, because uh, I need to say here that there is no scientific uh, landfill site. In Nigeria. I don't know if there's anywhere in Africa anyway, but in Nigeria, I'm so sure. South Africa, yes, okay, yeah, thank you. I know that it's South Africa, okay, thank you. Yeah, so, uh, so I've covered about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven states in the southwestern Nigeria looking at the impact of open dump sites on soils, the technical property of soils and uh, groundwater, and including FCT. Two landfill, specifically in FCT. And about four in Lagos, the most popular, I mean, the most commercial uh, state 
in Nigeria. So we have about four, 12 dump sites uh, which I have looked at, and uh, what is the summary of this result? Okay, well, this is what uh, this is. Uh, we all know this uh, a typical and exemplified land view. So what I do is to look at the cover system, the liner, and the cover system, the base, and the I mean the bottom and the uh, the cap. Look at the geotechnical uh, properties. Okay, so these are my research tools. I use geology because my background is geology. So I know that anything that you do has to do with the soil. So I need to understand the fundamental and nature of the geology of the area. So I use geophysics uh, to study the subsurface. I use geotechnics to also look at the technicality of the subsurface materials and uh, hydrogeology to look at the condition of water, the water movement and the implication. These are some of the result of findings. Uh, this is the way the soil layers is always represented geophysically. You, I'm just displayed, this is just a typical uh, representation of the VES, that's vertical electrical sanding that we have. Uh, this is telling us two, three, four layers typically, and this is representing the basement complex area of Nigeria. I need to tell you that Nigeria is typically of two base, I mean two uh, geological formations and uh, the transitions as we have them. So this is typical of the basement complex area of Nigeria, three to four layers, and uh, this is typical of the sedimentary terrains of Nigeria. We have about also three to four layers, but the geology, uh, the geological representation, the lithologies are different in their textures and the geomorph and the green ge uh, geomorphologies. Yeah, this is uh, what is typical that you see in a uh, basement complex, I mean, sedimentary terrain, the migration of uh, uh, leachates into the other ground and the polluting groundwater uh, system. Uh, we are conversant with this, and uh, this is one of the things that we monitor in uh, part of my work. This is a 2D uh, imaging of the subsurface. Uh, this, this result is typically from uh, Lagos State, uh, to be precise. Yes, I don't want to bother us with graphs and tables of uh, findings, so I've tried to abridge some of the findings from uh, my work, talking about the barrier system and the geotechnical uh, suitability of properties of this, uh, uh, the barrier system. Uh, when I say barrier system, I'm talking about locally, local materials such as clay, okay, which is uh, abound in Nigeria. Uh, specific gravity ranging without figure, plus intended ranging without figure, uh, activities of clay without figure, and the uh, coefficient of probability, which is a very important uh, property uh, for materials as liner and the mineralogy in the, I mean, in that figure. We, from this representation, you see that uh, it, I mean, it varies from uh, uh, being uh, suitable until not being suitable. And that is why the issue of clusterization of these uh, fields uh, comes in into uh, suitable and uh, not suitable based on the uh, product or uh, result. Oh, okay, yeah. This is just one of the uh, paper. This paper was published uh, in India Journal of uh, Geoscience. It was 2015. Okay, thank you. This is one of the paper published, and it has some of those results. Yes, of the results of findings uh, from the work. Like I said, I don't want to bother us. Okay, so sometimes we also look at the uh, water situation, I told you I use hydrogeology as part of my study tools. So I look at the quality of water within and uh, within the uh, landfill and also as control, uh, distance away from uh, maybe some radius as a way of controlling the result from the wisdom site. So this is an example of what we see. This is representing a sample from a basement complex area. And uh, I think the one previous one before this uh, is representing the one from uh, basement complex area. Geology is very core into uh, our study, so we do it based on, on uh, geology. Yeah, this is uh, also heavy metal concentration in the upside, in the most upside in uh, Nigeria. This is part of our findings, and uh, you will see that most of the landfills represented by L1, L2, A, and R have the metal concentrations, heavy metal concentrations higher than the uh, the minor enrichment that is expected, which is the blue line that we see there. So that is telling us the adverse effect of the of the waste dump site 
on the environment, especially the soil and the water. Yes, I, like I said earlier, that we also now do a way of containing, I mean, containing heavy metals uh, from uh, mining activities. Recall, I showed you the mineral phase of Nigeria, well, the mineral deposit of Nigeria. Like I said, when the mining has taken place, the tailings are dropped, the water comes upon it, it flows into the nearby uh, river body, I mean, water bodies. And uh, so what do we do? Uh, so we try to also look at uh, using local materials. The red one there is the orange peels, orange peels. And uh, the, the light one, which is the top left, uh, top right, is the orange alberdi. That is the next layer to the orange peel. And uh, the one below, okay? Yeah, the one below is the locally obtained uh, clay, okay, which is normally used for pottery and all of that. Okay, so uh, we do a blend of these two materials, and that is what we have in the bottom uh, the bottom right, uh, that is a clay, clay, orange albedo uh, impregnated. Okay, so what we do is to try to run the wastewater through and they see how much of correction is going to do to this water in terms of physical properties and that of the heavy metal or chemical properties. So this study is just showing that of the physical properties. And if you look at it, we have the plot of H, I mean pH, for modified and unmodified, that is the, 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 the sample that is not modified and the sample, I mean that is not impregnated and the sample that is uh, impregnated. So for pH, you will see that it has brought the pH down, telling us that uh, the amendment has worked to control the pH of the water instead of being acidic, it's coming more alkaline, which is good for the body system. Then we also see that for TDS here, yes, it has also reduced the total dissolved solid. That is the the, the bottom uh, left bottom uh, symbol there. So you see that in a way it has controlled the physical properties of water. So the question now is, will it also control the chemical properties, especially the subselected heavy metals? And that is the next thing. So I said, what is next? One is to extend uh, the extension of landfill study to other parts of the country with collaboration, uh, okay, in collaboration with experts in developed world. Like I said earlier, no landfill in Nigeria. But I know that one day, very soon, Nigeria will get into it. So we are trying to prepare the ground and uh, give information about the potentiality for, for it. So that is one thing. That, the next thing is uh, understanding the reactivity inside landfill and, and uh, see what goes on within landfill in terms of chemical reactions and being able to uh, ask as long as it's going to affect and the implication, I mean to say, on the landfill uh, lifespan. And uh, the other one is, I said, what, heavy, uh, what specific heavy metals are absorbed or will be absorbed by what type of clay? Okay, from the last something I showed to us, I uh, want to see as a further research what specific heavy metals will be absorbed by what type of clay? What clay are we uh, amending and uh, which one, which heavy metal will be absorbed? You know, so that is uh, the next phase of research. Then uh, the next one is, uh, uh, because this is very, very jabbing and important to me, uh, establishment of a center for environmental management in uh, my university. This is uh, one of the reasons why I'm here. I've come here to learn. Uh, to pick information and to learn from uh, 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 specialists from institute here so that when I get back to Nigeria, get out of my school, I'm having the support of my university by chancellor to be here so that I can replicate what is happening in other parts of the developed world in my university. And uh, this question came to me yesterday. I don't know if uh, it will be answered at this two forum. I said, can we have alternative for use of natural resources as a major raw materials for most products. I said, for instance, okay, food, food substitute have come. For instance, do we have substitute for lithium in battery production? Because we know that we are talking about environmental degradation, environmental problems, because much of our challenges are being caused by extraction of raw materials, I mean, natural resources. 
meaning that by the time we reduce extraction of natural resources, there will be a reduction from Bay on uh, the implication, the implications on the environment. So the question is, those ones that are existing, what we have had before, can we do an improvement on as a way of uh, using them for what we need, for what the world needs? For example, now, we need battery, we need functional battery. So thank you. This is uh, what I have to say. I'm grateful again for the privilege to talk at this forum. Thank you. Dr. Ige, uh, it's good to know about your university and your expertise and I'm sure that the uh, group which you are looking for and its members are sitting over here and uh, you can contact all of them. So this will help you. Thank you very much. Uh, now I have the privilege of uh, introducing you to my very close friend, our Chief Medical Officer of IIT Bombay. So, Dr. Meshram, Arvind Meshram is here. He is the person who keeps us fit. And by giving advices, by joining us over morning walk, and of course the messages which he sends to the entire campus community uh, regarding health. So, Dr. Meshram, uh, welcome. Uh, please take your time. Just give them an idea about uh, what's happening in IIT Bombay as far as health facilities are concerned. Because this group is talking about our subject, environmental geotechnics and the health risk. Uh, Theo is an expert and many other experts are over here who have been talking about how to link these two things. And this is what I've been trying to do since last few years. Over to you, please. Thank you, uh, Professor Dian Singh. Uh, actually, I didn't know where I should start because this is a very different field for me. and. Uh, uh, we deal with a very different thing, but I think most of the things are interrelated, the environment and the health uh, per se are interrelated. All of us, when we talk about environment, also talk about the health uh, in general. Uh, I'm here to give you a very brief uh, introduction of our hospital and what we do and what we are trying to achieve in, in the hospital. So I am Dr. Amin Meshram. I am the in charge of IIT Bombay <laughs> Hospital. And uh, as I said, this is a very brief information about the hospital and what we are tr trying to do. So the Institute Hospital uh, is a primary healthcare system located centrally in the campus. So we look after the staff, uh, that is the, that includes the students, the staff, and the faculties. So uh, I'll just give you a very small number of uh, people who will, just for this, if you see, just say the students. Uh, right now there are only uh, 13,000 students in the campus uh, who take care of the facility, or rather who take the facilities from the IIT hospital, apart from the staff and the faculty. Okay, uh, so we have a, like any other hospital, we have an outpatient and an inpatient facility. We had a, have a dedicated staff, 80 uh, well-trained staff who give services to the, the community. And the hospital services are free of cost to all the employees who are entitled for the hospital services. So when you say OPD services, that is outpatient services, we have medical officers who uh, look after all the patients who come to the hospital. And in consultation of those with the specialists, if there is any need, they do uh, impart the other facilities, like if the surgical process is to be done or surgical uh, uh, discharge is to be done or any other such things which are required, they do help in that. So we have specialists in medical, surgical uh, faculties. We have our OPD as well as uh, uh, pharmacy, pathology lab, X-ray and sonography, dental department, physiotherapy department, homeopathy department, which is new, uh, which was there earlier, but have, we have a uh, newly appointed doctor. So we are basically looking into a home holistic approach to the to the health, rather than just an allopathic approach. So we are also saying that no, it is not that one faculty should be seen. A holistic approach should be uh, is required for a health initiative. In the inpatient care, we have a well-equipped emergency, which is uh, available 24-7, uh, day or night, to all the patients available. Uh, we have a general ward as well as isolation ward for infectious diseases. Uh, this is just a, so in IIT hospital basically strives to give a comprehensive, preventive, curative and rehabilitative services to our patients. The stress is more on the preventive aspect of the health because once we don't want many patients to come because once the prevention is done and the trust area is prevention because uh, curative, there are so many curative things are coming in the world. Uh, people are confused, as somebody said just like uh, now, uh, lifestyle modification is the is the key word. If you do that, I think most of the diseases will disappear or at least mitigated. 
so we generally uh, see to it uh, imparting knowledge to the patients when they come to us that this is what is required not the medicine in the long run medicine is going to give a plus and a minus effect but lifestyle modification will always be there for your help so this is we generally try to do and we are also in the process of upgrading our hospital uh, information system uh, this is basically the uh, aim is to simplify the process of patient coming to the hospital and overall uh, their experience when they, they could come to the hospital uh, it has to be a very good experience it should not happen that okay uh, something happened and the patient couldn't be seen properly couldn't be diagnosed properly couldn't be given treatment properly uh, that should not happen in any hospitals anywhere in the world not just in iit bombay so uh, we are also trying to upgrade that system i hope that the system works properly and um, in the last i would say healthy health is is a common goal for all of us whether it is environmentalist or anybody else in this in this world thank you thank you for the opportunity so oh, thank you dr meshram uh, the whole idea of calling you over here was that there is a group of uh, researchers who are working on during covid time how our hospitals manage the covid waste and magdalena will talk to you during lunch and uh, some of the other researchers because solid waste is the main theme and in fact uh, they are working in the area where they would like to quantify what measures were taken particularly by the health centers and hospitals where you can throw some light and this is the theme on which we want to collaborate with medical uh, professionals like you and we have been talking a lot about all these things so thank you very much uh, for being here then everybody can discuss with you